Okay. Yeah. You can hear me? Okay. Closest? Is that okay? Right. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Ladies and gentlemen, dear comrades, a last time, please take your seats right now. We have a 10 minute delay by now. You will find additional seats on the tribunes on the first floor. Please sit down now.
Tag, Berlin. Good afternoon, Europe. Welcome to the 12th PES Congress and the Congress marking the 30th uh, anniversary of the Party of European Socialists. It's so wonderful to see everybody here physically, Ken, after all those years of COVID. And um, we welcoming delegates, party leaders, MEPs, MPs, special guests. Uh, it's really, really lovely to see everybody here. Very lovely to be here. Very lovely to be here with Saar van Buren. My name is uh, Giacomo Fidibek, and I'm extremely pleased to open the Congress together with all of you today and to initiate the thanking that we owe to our hosting partner, partner and party, the SPD. I would recommend to show warmly that their hospitality is very precious to all of us. It is, a, it is an important day. It's the first day of our Congress, and we will have some very few key decisions to make. The very first one will be to adopt the Congress resolution. It will be our guiding Bible for uh, the next future, setting out the progressive answers for the key challenges that are facing Europe today. But we will also do other uh, important decisions. We will uh, adopt changes to our statutes in order to make our organization more inclusive, more feminist, more uh, uh, representative, uh, <laughs> stronger in one word. <laughs> Because this is the task of a leadership of a European political party, to always make stronger our community, our family, our movement. But most importantly, we will do, and we will take another very important decision today. We will elect a new leadership, a new president. And this, we will come back uh, to it soon. To kick off, to begin our... Uh, conversations today with the different leaders that will animate our debate, I would very much like to invite uh, on stage a champion for uh, democracy and uh, rule of law inside the European Parliament. The Vice President of the European Parliament and the SPD representative for Europe, Katerina Barley. And I would like to welcome on stage our Secretary General of the Party of European Socialists, Achim Post. <laughs> welcome both. Achim, can yeah. you tell us a little bit more? I mean, Giacomo explained all the procedures. What are we going to do here today? But why is it so important that we are here today? Why is it important for Europe to so be here together together? The question is what the Congress is about. Huh? You yes. want to know that before. Exactly. So I will tell you what the Congress is about. The Congress, first of all, is about two former prime ministers, two real socialists and social democrats, about Sergei Stanishev and Stefan Löwen. <laughs> and we are here at the 30th anniversary of uh, PS. So we started 92 in The Hague. And one person, was behind all that and signed that, the first president of PS, Willy Klaas. Willy, we are honored that you are here. <laughs> and the Congress is about you, friends, delegates, guests, comrades, because without you, the whole organization would be nothing. And therefore, I want to say to you, just as an information, the Chancellor will come next day, tomorrow. Olaf Scholz will come tomorrow. The Austrian Chancellor, the next Austrian Chancellor, is here today, Pamela Rendi-Wagner. <laughs> and, and to follow your question, we had, before Corona times, wonderful, strong Congresses in Lisbon, and in Madrid, and I want to use this opportunity to thank Pedro Sanchez and Psoe, Antonio Costa and PS Portugal. You made it wonderful. <laughs> and, and therefore, PS today has just one task, to follow your example. 
And I have to say, I'm really grateful. Last Kling by the leader of the SPD and Katharina Bali, the special envoy for the SPD for Europe, that you make it, that you invite us. Thanks for that. And final point. The others are joining forces. The Christian Democrats, the Conservatives, together with populists, with right-wingers, sometimes with post-fascists. They did it in Sweden. They did it in Italy. They would do it in Spain, but we will we'll not let them through because Pedro Sanchez is much stronger than them. So, to sum that up, the right is wrong completely. We are right. That's good. The left is right, the right is wrong. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Achim. Well, Katarina, the left was right one year ago when SPD won the election. That was a great result for your party, but it was an important result for the rest of European progressives. We looked at SPD, we look at your performance, we look at the policies you introduce, because you have the task, the responsibility, if you want also the burden sometimes, to show leadership in Europe in order to change Europe for the better. What would be the SPD role in this fight for progressive policies, for progressive changes, for the European Union of the future? Well, first of all, let me thank you for accepting our invitation. Of course, it's also the invitation of the PES, but we are very, very grateful that you are here in Berlin in this wonderful city and in a very symbolic city, of course, also, uh, especially in these times. Uh, I can speak here, I think, on behalf of my party leaders, uh, Lars Klingbeil and also Saskia Esken, and uh, the whole of the SPD. It is a special year for PES. It is the 30th anniversary, and if we look what has changed since, um, we have to say that we are in very difficult times now. As you said, we won the elections. It was, uh, well, ele an election result that not everybody had foreseen. And we are very happy because we started the election campaign when we were, I think, at about 15%. And in the end, we won with quite a bit of margin in front of the Conservatives. So this to all of you who are still in election campaigns or are having them in front of them, this is the first lesson. If you are still lacking behind, never give up. You can make it if you have a strong party behind you and a super candidate as we had. Now this... <laughs> now this government has not, uh, has, has not been in, uh, in charge for, for a year and we see the whole world not fall apart but, but crumble and change massively. We are still battling the consequences of the corona crisis. We are now facing an energy crisis, inflation. So we are all in this boat together. And who else could have answers to this than social democrats? Because it's more than all, it's social questions now. It's people who don't know how to pay their energy bills. It's people who don't know how to pay their loans. It's people who don't know how to fill their fridge at the end of the month. And this is, for me, the message that we have to take, uh, take with us from this Congress. It's difficult times, and we, in our coalition, which is not always an easy coalition, we have two partners and two very different partners, but in this coalition, we are fighting for exactly that. We need what our party leader uh, and, and all of us, uh, what Olaf Scholz called the Zeitenwende, and uh, so a, a really shift in paradigm. And uh, we have to take what Lars Klingbeil said, uh, a leading role here and there. This we will do. We will push, as Olaf Scholz did, for example, for the recovery plan. I think this is still something that is well in our memories when he tackled the crisis, the corona crisis and its consequences in a very European way, I would say, when he was still um, Minister of Finance. And this is the way that this SPD and this coalition will tackle the difficult times that we are facing at the moment, but together in our social democratic family. Wow. Thank you, Thank Katharina. You, Katharina. Thank you, Achim. Thank you, Achim. We will see much more of you these days. And we're very happy about that. Now we have to start our more procedural part of the Congress. And um, I would like to 
draw your attention to the fact that we will have to elect two Congress chairs. And the Congress chairs... Yes, I, will, I will, would like to welcome them on stage. First of all, Alicia Holmes. Uh, give her an applause. President of the European Socialist and Member of European Parliament for PSOE. And of course, also Member of Parliament uh, for Vooruit, uh, Caroline Genet. So, I would say that from the applause that they got, we can consider this approved by acclamation. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Well, so we're all agreeing on this already. Yes. That's a good start. And um, to start off, I actually would like to ask Achim back on stage again. It's a bit of gymnastic for Achim, yes. you know? <laughs> he needs to do some exercise. <laughs> yes, you're back again to announce someone special. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have to tell you, so I think you did it already in a small group this morning and now you can do it for the so full Congress and everybody watching online, by the way. So Za and Giacomo told me I should introduce Sergei Stanishev. But I will not do that because I guess it's not necessary to introduce a great European socialist, to introduce a great leader and to introduce somebody who worked very hard for our family so I guess I will reject your <laughs> invitation. <laughs> invitation. I will do it by my own. I just want to say, Sergei, when we started 10 years ago as a political team, as political partners, I can say now, today, here in Berlin, at Verti Music Hall, now we are not only political partners, we are real friends, and I can tell you that is the truth for everybody here. <laughs> Therefore, You look for you, they are building up something. Therefore, the floor is up to you, Sergei Stanishev. After so many efforts, it works. <laughs> dear friends, dear comrades, it happened so in my life that Party of European Socialists and Europe have always played a key role. I was elected a leader of the Bulgarian Socialist Party back in 2001. And uh, one of my key priorities then when my, my party was not a member of the Socialist International, not a member of the Party of European Socialists, was first to integrate our party to the European Social Democratic family. And second, to bring successfully Bulgaria to the European Union as a full member. Both things happened, but frankly speaking, I never dreamed that someday I may be leader of the whole European socialist family. And I still remember 2011, when I was standing in front of you for the first time in the capacity of a president of PES, and I remember the excitement, the thrill, and I can tell you, it's still here. I still feel my heart's beating stronger. <laughs> and uh, I always took this position as a great privilege, honor, and responsibility. And I hope that through all these years, I didn't let down your trust and support. I was always putting the interests of the family at the first place. 
even when there was a high political price to pay for this, and probably PS women know it best. <laughs> I strongly believe, however, in politics as a collective effort. So I would like to thank you all for all these years of collaboration, together work, which made social democracy stronger nationally and at the European level. Because one person cannot achieve anything, but collectively we can do everything. And I would like to thank our small but very devoted PES team for the support, for the creativity, for the loyalty, and for the friendship. It's a big privilege, especially in politics, not to work only with people who share common values, but on whom you can rely and trust, and this feeling is mutual. So thank you all, people in the PES, in our Secretariat, working for this. Our parties and organizations are the basis of our strength. So our team tried in the last years to bring PES closer to the ground where your daily fights are happening. And I think we did a lot to support every individual party. And of course, special thanks to PES activists. You are the blood cells of our movement of people who are really committed to the European idea who are daily, daily working to make our party stronger. Thank you for your commitments. I hope you will become more and more and more powerful. <laughs> I've always been following two simple principles in our work. Respect for every party, every organization, and individual in the family, and dialogue. And both seen through the prism of our values because I think we managed to make PES much more than a sum of 34 parties. Something which is a common space where social democracy can strive, can thrive, where social democracy can develop European policies and propose policies for the future. I believe that uh, now, from now on, Stefan Löwen, taking this position, will be an excellent president of the PES. Because Stefan is not only a very successful party leader in, back in Sweden, a very successful prime minister, but also a true European, and a person with great skills to consolidate, to look for uh, policies which are uniting, which are overcoming differences, and this is extremely important for our family to grow stronger, to develop new policies which will be supported by the whole family. So good luck, Steph good luck, Stefan. And I hope that the social pillar idea which you authored back in 2017 as prime minister will become a reality at the European level while you are president of the PES. So bring all these ideas into reality and deliver. But just think for one moment where we have been back in 2011 as a family and where we are now. In 2011, Europe was dominated by the conservatives who imposed austerity on every country, on every government, and people were suffering. The whole fabric of the societies, especially in the South, was destroyed. Many of our parties suffered heavily politically because of that. Like PASOK, but also in Spain, in Italy, in Portugal, it was a heavy moment, a difficult moment. We are fighting back, but we are not strong enough. I can claim today that there is no European policy without a strong social democratic imprint on it. This is really um, something for which we can thank our prime ministers, our commissioners, our group in the European Parliament, all national parties to make it into realities. And look, I cannot say all these policies because there are too much of them, but from the grand ideas as the next generation EU plan and European Green Deal through SURE, which helps people keep their jobs in these difficult times, to directly for 
adequate minimum wages, just transition fund, European social fund, and youth guarantee and child guarantee. It's all social democratic policies which are becoming realities, which change life of people on a daily basis. And we should be very proud of our achievements. But <laughs> the past is worthy of pride, but politics is always a talk about the future. And we can't really predict the future. But we can preempt many elements and we can influence it. And I can say that we have the political and institutional strength to influence the future through the perspective of our left progressive values, which are so much needed in Europe in these turbulent days. That defines who we are. And we can all feel, every person in Europe can feel that the world is changing fundamentally and in such a pace that people are frightened. They feel themselves insecure. They feel many of them abandoned. They worry about their jobs, about their incomes, about their security. And we are the ones who show that we listen to them. And not only listen, but we find, propose, and fight for solutions. Because there are two emotions in politics which drive politics and life. Usually, it's fear and hope. And there are enough forces who use people's fear, who play on it, promising them a golden past or a shelter against the insecurities. But we are the political family, which has in our DNA the direction towards the future, a future which is better, a future which is progressive, and in the interests of many and not the few. This is our big advantage. Because we can see today there are many subjects with looks common. Everybody is talking about digitalization, but the right wing sees it mainly as a great opportunity for profit. We see the benefits of this process, which is changing our economies, creating many comfortable things, but also creating inequalities and bringing about risks which can lead to a whole new class of useless people. There is a strong majority in Europe for a green transition, but only we insist that it will only be successful if it's socially just if it provides instruments to protect all who will be at risk. Everybody now is talking about Europe's energy independence, Europe's energy security, but it's the social democrats who stress the need on our energy production and consumption to be sustainable, both environmentally, but also politically, in order to protect the planet to be in solidarity with the future generations, but also to provide jobs and to secure people in these times. And of course, discussing today in our resolution about long-term plans and perspectives and policies for Europe, we should not forget the daily needs because this winter, next year will be tough and we need to provide European solutions which will shelter people and shelter our enterprises. It's good to have national plans which are so, so much needed, but it, we also need to have a European solutions as we did on COVID-19, because otherwise Europe will be in trouble. And our family, if we don't deliver, may pay the political price. I'm talking this because we have to be aware of it in order to avoid it and really to save Europe. Our responsibility is to address all these challenges and risks and develop a plan which is about future and which is hopeful. In the 20th century, social democracy tamed the forces of market capitalism through the regulations of the welfare state. Now, in the 21st century, we must regulate all the transitions in the public interest, not in the interest of the big companies, and not let the rude element of capitalism to subdue humanity for its own interests. And then there is also a war ranging in Europe again. There are tens of thousands of lives which have been lost to it already. Millions became refugees and live in despair and in harsh conditions. 
war, brute force, are against everything we stand for. Europe had an immediate, swift, and united resolute response in the face of aggression. It provides a vast variety of support to the people of Ukraine. We should be even more worried by the constant and rapid escalation of the war, which has its own logic, rules, and always tends to expand in its cruelty and scale. We should never forget that Europe is a peace project. Today, there is too much talk about military victory, too little discussions on how to stop this madness and to search for ways for political solution. I have no doubts it would be extremely difficult because it doesn't depend only on us social democrats and not only on Europe. But every effort is worth trying. After all, we are conducting our Congress in the city of Berlin, the city of Willy Brandt, and his shining example should lead us also in these difficult times because he had the courage to develop policies which led to the Helsinki Act and then in the end, at the final consequence to the fall of the Berlin Wall. <laughs> Dear friends, we all feel that we live in a historical moment in the development of the world, Europe, and our movement. In order to overcome all, all the challenges and risks, we surely need to have a clear moral compass. And we are best suited for these challenges with our values of solidarity, human dignity, justice, and equality. This is something what people need. We have to be recepti receptive and listen to what people are talking about their concerns. And we have to work with the grassroots movements like the trade unions, like many organizations. We need to have critical thinking this is the European Enlightenment project, to see the realities as they are and to find real solutions and deliver on that basis. And of course, the courage and political will to do what we believe is right, because that matters in politics. There is a one phrase by John Atanasov, a Bulgarian by origin who created computer, who said, you need more courage in thinking than being in open space. So let's be courageous today and let's be courageous in the future in order to deliver what is needed. I'm a historian by education and I can tell you that history is not a story about the past. History is a story about a permanent change in our development as societies. And when acting, we must act with unity and determination to show that we can lead Europe towards the road of justice, equality, and humane future. This is our strength. And I would like each one of you, each one of us, to bring back to our countries this message that social democracy is a movement of change of Europe and the world for better. And we have the will to do this, and not just it's not about fighting with our political opponents on the right, but it's about saving humanity, which is challenged today. And uh, we have to say clearly today and tomorrow in our Congress, we are ready to do this. We are ready for this battle. And we are in this with all our hearts. And as you know, the heart always beats on the left. Thank you very much. Mr. President. Mr. President. Dr. President. Come back on stage, please, Serga. Come back on stage. So everybody can see you. <laughs> and also, you are 
our great leader, but we also, you had a great team of vice presidents with you to share the task. So we invite you all up. We are inviting the vice president team of uh, Francisco André, Katarina Medalova, Helen Fritzson, Zita Gurmai, a Space Women President, Akin Post, Secretary General, Jon Nekpoli, Deputy Secretary General. Thank you, Sergei. So, as we said before, this Congress is also about the marking of 30 years of PES, 30 years of progress. And let's just have a look at all those key moments of the past 30 years. When the countries that had waged war against one another decided to work for peace, socialists imagined a new Europe in a continent destroyed. The new European communities were forged, and with a common dream for a better future, social democrats organized. As European integration deepened, so did cooperation between the socialist parties of Europe. Socialists led major social improvements, laying the foundations for the European social model, inspired by the struggles of their time across Europe. Voters placed their trust in progressive politics. Together, Europe worked to overcome crises, and integration advanced, strengthening the bonds that unite our European nations. A new Europe was emerging. Overcoming differences, socialists agreed upon a political program for freedom, equality, justice and the environment. The first direct European elections brought with them a socialist victory. It was our moment. And a time of profound political upheaval which left the world forever changed. A new, larger, stronger Europe was on the rise, and Social Democrats were ready for it. A European political party was born, bringing together the proud, progressive traditions of each European nation. Socialist, Social Democratic, Labour and Democratic parties united, alongside new organisations, to work for the betterment of all. We grew closer in a continent that was on the right path. We welcomed another 12 sister parties from 10 new member states. We expanded across the whole continent and beyond. And when the banks crashed, we fought for people. We campaigned to change global finance so citizens would never again bear the burden of reckless behavior in the financial sector. Through the common candidate process, we went into the European elections with our common candidate, Martin Schulz, with thousands of activists alongside us. We said yes to action for the climate. We stood for jobs, education and culture for young people and for rights of children. We presented our European youth plan. We supported countries in our neighborhood. Young Europeans welcomed our ideas to support them. We proclaimed the European pillar of social rights for us, Europe is more than a market. We applied diplomacy to heal old tensions. Together with our common candidate, Franz Timmermans, we rode the Tour de France across Europe to spread a message of hope for the 2019 European elections. We transformed Europe with the European Green Deal. Our policies shaped the European response to the social and economic consequences of the coronavirus through responsible leadership. And now we're building our energy independence. Supporting our allies, we're securing fair wages. We're fighting for an equal Europe. 
This is our history, and we're proud of it. It gives us strength to shape the future for the good of people all over Europe. This is our history, and we are proud of it. You need to know your past in order to imagine the future. And the future may well be about to come up. It's a pleasure to introduce the candidate to be the next president of the Party of European Socialists, the former prime minister and party leader of the Social Democratic Party in Sweden, Stefan Levin. The floor is yours. Delegates, friends, dear SPD, thank you so much for hosting us here in Red Berlin. And um, 30 years after that we were founded, this uh, PES was founded, I think we are still as young and even more eager to, with courage, make sure that we lead change, that we lead Europe. First of all, I want to turn to you, Sergei. I want to thank you so much for your steady leadership, for always standing up firmly for our values. And we will always, always be grateful for your efforts and your achievements as President of HES. Thank you. Dear friends, as a newborn, my mother had to leave me at an orphanage. The circumstances were too difficult. She could not keep both her sons. It is hard to imagine how terribly tough it must have been for her to leave her child. But she did it knowing that the society would help her son to have a better life than she herself had the opportunity to. So when I was a very small boy, I ended up with those who would become my parents, Iris and Tuda. And they gave me the love and the security that every child is entitled to. Why am I telling this? I'm saying this because without knowing it, a seed was planted for my understanding and realization of the importance of community, solidarity, the equal value of all people. And that insight and conviction shaped me into being a social democrat. I know, I know there are many different directions, many different paths that my life could have taken. But thanks to a society built on solidarity, where people not only took responsibility for themselves, but also for me, I was able to have a safe and happy life. And to me, that sums up the main goals, goals of the social democratic movement. Namely, that the fight for human dignity requires equality. That equality is a prerequisite for the freedom of all people and the most important condition for achieving equality is a society built on solidarity. That insight led me to join the Youth League, SSU, and later also engaged myself in the Swedish trade union, both Metal Workers Union and IF Metal. I carried that conviction with me during 10 years as a party leader of the Social Democratic Party in Sweden and as seven, uh, seven years as the Prime Minister of Sweden. And it, it exactly that conviction, conviction that I will carry with me also if I be elected President 
OPEC. It is with humility that I am prepared to accept the assignment, and I will do my very, very best for PES and the values for our political family. But I will also demand from all of you that we do this together. It is together that we shape visions for the Europe of the future. It is together that we work out our joint political proposals and thus win the trust of Europe's citizens, both in the election for the European Parliament in 2024, but also in every national election. And we know that one party's success is everyone's success, and we need more social democratic governments in Europe. All these places demands on us, places demand on PES. And I want to lead an open and inclusive PES with an equal leadership, a strong, transparent, and efficient organization where we put our trust in one another and where we also earn the citizens' trust. We must take our legitimate place in European politics with our visions, our ideas, and also practical politics for Europe's cohesion and future. And our strength is that we are so many. We are so many, and this diversity of voices can that constantly ensure that we aim high and also that we can be the best versions of ourselves. Let me give you some examples. The future belongs to the youth, and that is why I'm a strong supporter of our youth association, yes. Success, <laughs> success is a matter of organization, and therefore I'm grateful for all the PES activists who are here on the ground and our, our grassroots movement, you keep the flame alive. The equal value of all people means the right to love whoever you want. And that is why I'm proud of the Rainbow Rose. <laughs> Equality is a question of equal treatment. And therefore, as a feminist, I'm a strong supporter of PES women. A life of work deserves respect, and therefore we honor our European senior organization. All politics are also local, and therefore our network of regional and local elected and our PES group in the Committee of Regions is so important. Politics is grounded on ideas, and therefore our own think tank, FEPS, play a central role in shaping our political direction. <laughs> Europe is a part of the world. Therefore, our own global platform, the Global Progressive Forum, is an extended arm in the work for global solidarity. <laughs> Change is a matter of power. And that is why our s and parliamentary group is an important force for change, and I do very much look forward to working closely with their leadership. <laughs> Last but not least, leadership must be rooted in solidarity, and therefore our party leaders, our social democratic prime ministers, our social democratic, democratic commissioners are indispensable, and it is together with our leaders that will shape the political direction. So, each of you in here is one of our leaders. You should all feel that responsibility and that pride, and together we will take responsibility for Europe's way forward. Dear friends, we live in very troubled times. 
the serious security situation, the climate threat, the growing divides, the threat to democracy, are some of the major challenges we collectively face. And in times like these, we Social Democrats have a decisive role. We have now an important uh, European Parliament election in less than two years, but we must also focus our gaze beyond that, with visions and at the same time keep both feet on the ground. Peace should and will stand for hope, for faith in the future, and in troubled times, citizens will demand answers and solutions. Answers on our safety and security, the climate, energy prices, the whole housing shortage, job security, gender equality, and equal opportunities. People need to know and feel that we have the answers to what citizens are worried about. And at the same time, we can never stop looking forward towards the horizon, what is beyond the most urgent current affairs. We need to think ahead to have a vision for the future, because it is now that we write the history books of the future. It is now we decide what future generations will say about us. What do we want young people to read in their textbooks about the time we live in right now? I want them to read that it was now that we took the important decisive steps to save the planet that we equipped ourselves for security and peace, that we fought the divisions that split our societies. PES must always be this unifying force. We are the political movement that, in times of division and unrest, can bring people together in a common conviction about the equal value of all people. So we will, thanks to our differences, gather people around Europe who wants to fight for equality, freedom, and solidarity, who wants to defend our safety and security here and now, but also build common security for the whole world, who wants to love in freedom and peace, who wants to protect democracy, and human dignity. We will gather men and women, young and old, who want to fight for a bright and hopeful future. We must rise to the occasion. Our generation must secure peace, manage the climate, and win democracy, and shape a society in which no one is left behind. So together, Together, together we will, with our friends, all human beings, fellow human beings, we shall shape the future with courage for Europe. We will instill hope that the days ahead of us are the best. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Stefan. Big applause for our candidate president. Thank you for your personal words, for your strong vision, the way you want to cooperate. And we're looking forward to the vote later today. So, Giacomo. Here I am. There you are. Since you're talking about <laughs> votes, then now this is the moment to engage with our uh, Congress chairs, because we have a couple of votes ahead of us. And, uh, and it will be the task of uh, Caroline and Alicia to guide you through this process. Before they begin, though, I would like to remind you that in the course of the day, there may be speeches in different languages. 
So you are warmly invited to provide, uh, to be provided with uh, headphones in order to make sure you will understand the important things that will be said by the podium. Caroline. Dear friends, first of all, also on our behalf, Alicia and I are really happy to be back and to be back together live. And we are here not only to celebrate a birthday, and uh, we have to celebrate a couple of founding fathers especially. Akim mentioned already our first president 30 years ago, Willy Klaas from my own party in Belgium, presiding over a party with 12 members only. Today we are 33, we have 12 observers and 12 associated member parties. So, of course, we need change. Of course, we need progress. And of course, we need cooperation. And the most important thing to have a strong PES is to have a democratic rooted PES that makes the difference, not only in the European Parliament, but also in daily life of ordinary people and also for all the activists that are here present today. Because it is them who make the difference for a strong political party. And I'd like to praise all the activists and all the delegates, of course, next to our leaders and prime ministers, vice presidents of the PS that are present here today. So I would say a big round of applause and happy birthday for all socialists and Democrats here today. And of course, the formal moment is there. We will keep it short and procedural, as asked, so we can start the vote. Alicia will explain the procedure, and afterwards, we'll come back to you with the surprising, undoubtedly, result of the election of our new PS president. Well, thank you, Caroline. Uh, before explaining the, the whole procedure for the vote, it's not that difficult, I promise. Uh, I would like to say happy birthday to PES, but uh, me as yes president, I'm really proud that we are becoming 30 together. Uh, many people <laughs> will know yes as ECOSI, uh, but I'm really proud that the youth is also becoming 30. <laughs> And also a special thanks uh, to the PS, uh, Sergei, uh, for giving us the opportunity to, yes, uh, of co-chairing this, this Congress. It's really important for us to collaborate together, and we hope that we will keep pushing uh, together with PS uh, in the near future. Uh, so thank you for that. And now uh, going to the Congress election. Um, you have received, um, we have to adopt the rules of procedure. Uh, I think all of you have received this document. Uh, so I would like to, to invite the, the delegates. Uh, I would like to, to ask you to approve, first of all, the rules of procedure that were sent uh, for this Congress re uh, regarding the presidency. So everybody's in favor of that? Yes. <laughs> Someone is against? <laughs> no, uh, ask it it's again. approved. So, uh, <laughs> no, 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 ask it, it again. <laughs> ask it again. Okay. Ask it again. Everybody is against? No. No? You favor everybody. So, um, following the presidency proposal, we will now elect uh, four tellers uh, who will be responsible for counting the votes. Uh, with support, of course, of the PS uh, Secretariat. Uh, so we have the four names. Those are uh, Neva Grasic from Slovenia, uh, Tero Semerica from Finland, uh, Alberto Bondesio from Spain, and Anne Lambelan from PS Belgium. So a big applause for them, too. <laughs> and following the presidency proposal, uh, the votes uh, can be cast by, by the head of delegations in order not to have uh, that much people in the box that is over there. Uh, you will see the people over there uh, to cast the votes. So I recommend the heads of delegation to cast these votes uh, over there. 
Uh, and now I think we can say that the vote has started until half past four, uh, 16.30. So we can start the voting during this time. Thank you. And the last few months, dear friends, we discussed a lot in the PS bodies on new statutes because um, to have a very transparent and democratic organization, we need statutes that work for the organization, for the member parties, and that also give a good representation in all PES bodies. We have a couple of amendments that have been discussed several times in the PES presidency, in the statutory committee, and we especially thank Zita and PS Women for driving, the, for being the driving force in gender equality, more feminism in PS, and also equality in our statutes. Normally, the behind the statutory changes would be projected on screen from PS Women, from PSOE. Spain and gender equality is at the core of the amendments just like climate activism, just like a more transparent organization. The statutory changes want to strengthen the political role of the PS leadership in good cooperation with the SND faction, broadening the PS leadership up to eight presidents making gender balance compulsory, strengthening, strengthening feminism, and allowing for remote statutory meetings like we had them the last few years. I know, dear friends, that discussing statutes is not that interesting, but still, we have to vote them. And uh, I'd like to ask the Congress to approve all the amendments the PS presidency agreed upon. Who is in favor? <laughs> Almost everyone. Is there any opposition? Only one. No, but a lonely was rider. Called before. No, no, he, he was, was called before. before. Okay. So approved. We hereby approve the new statutes as discussed in the presidency and the statutory body. Dear friends, we also have, in a broadening family, a couple of new parties strengthening. We have two new associated members. We give a warm welcome to Las Slovakia and to DK Hungary. Welcome in the PS. We also have two new candidate observer, observer members from Romania, pro-Romania, and from Italy, Articolo Uno. Welcome to the PS. And since uh, socialism never stops and it has to be evolved constantly, of course, there are also some of our member parties that changed their name, that changed their name to make a difference. And I see my own party leader in the public, my own party, SPA, Belgium, has turned its name into Vooruit. And please, can you approve? <laughs> SLD Poland is now called Nova Lewica, I think, in Polish. So please approve the new name of Nova Levico. And we also say goodbye to one of our member, former member parties, and that is Unia Prasi, also from Poland. We had to exclude. Thank you. So, you consider this approved? All of this has been approved. All of this have, have been approved, I imagine. For the sake of Thank the minutes, <laughs> so that we have it. Sir. I think everyone is. No Thank you very much, Caroline. Thank you very much, Alicia. Okay. You, sir. 
Okay, thank you for outlining the process. Chairs, important. And delegates, it's your moment to cast your votes. And you come back. Yes, that was great. And I hand over the floor again to Giacomo. So, as uh, Akim was uh, reminding us uh, in his intervention, we come from a uh, uh, few years where we didn't have the Congress. Our last statutory Congress was in uh, 2018 in Lisbon. And again, we are very grateful to our hosting, part and hosting party there. Uh, between 2018 and uh, nowadays, a lot of things have been happening in Europe. Back then, uh, we didn't have a pandemic. Back then, we were not hit by the tragedy of a war on the doorstep of uh, the European borders. In between, we have been uh, trying to perform at best as the Party of European Socialists in order to follow up the guidelines and uh, resolutions and the policy proposals that had been adopted back then in, tw in 2018 and in all the presidency meetings that followed in our past councils and in the meetings of our leadership. We would like to use the opportunity of uh, video support in order to show it to you, to represent it to you, how it looked like over the past years, the efforts that has passed we have put forward to defend our values and our ideas. Indeed. So first, let's have a look. In 2019, over 35 million people across Europe gave their votes to the Socialists and Democrats. Gerace Garcia Perez was elected president of the SD group. Once, Once again, the SD group was the leading progressive force in the European Parliament. From the start, the SD reinforced cooperation with our commissioners, PES, and with our national governments. The challenges quickly became clear the climate emergency, Brexit, and the rise of the far right, the COVID pandemic, Russia's war in Ukraine, and its social and economic. All these crises happened at the same time to the personal and political loss of our friend David Sassoon, the late president of the European Parliament. So what did we do? We pushed for an historic 1.8 trillion euro recovery package. We led the action plan on social rights in the quarter of 2021. We supported the next generation EU stimulus package. We made sure Europe's response was investment rather than austerity. The SD, the European Parliament established a permanent subcommittee on tax policy. With the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act adopted in July 2022, the SD Group promoted a high level of consumer protection. We supported the Commission's proposal to fight gender based violence. The fight for gender equality remains always at the core of our work. European values of democracy and the rule of law are also under attack. People's rights have been attacked by right wing EU governments, women's right to abortion, 
LGBTQI people's rights to love who they want. So, while conservatives supported far right, we stood up against bullies and corporate rats in Hungary, Poland, Slovenia, and Bulgaria, and made sure that EU taxpayers' money did not fall into rubber hands, and we successfully negotiated a new rule of law conditionality mechanism. In line with our commitment to solidarity, we triggered the temporary protection directive. We want the same sense of solidarity to apply to anyone seeking protection. We supported the Conference of the Future of Europe and many of the recommendations from citizens, like creating a European health committee making asylum and migration policy more humane, protecting human rights and the environment in business and trade. We have also worked with huge partnerships with like-minded progressives from across the globe. The EU Africa Partnership remains at the heart of our external policy. That of Shafia, led initiatives in Latin America, Israel and Palestine, strengthening ties with specific parties. We are also working on concrete policy recommendations that build a better future for all with our work in the Progressive Society Initiative. We are leading on sustainable trade and on new laws on responsible business practices. The war in Ukraine has serious consequences for social cohesion and economic stability in Europe. Without support, too many equal risks have been chewed between heating and eating this winter. Only a common European response with a windfall tax and a cap on energy prices can give people the support that they need. A lot of activity, as we can see, from the party and the group in the European Parliament. We will talk about it a little bit later. I first want to remind everybody that after this talk, we will also have an intervention of our host, uh, SPD co-leader Lars Klingbaum. But first, let's talk a little bit more about what we saw. And uh, therefore, I am proud to welcome on stage the president of uh, the SD group in the European Parliament, Irache Garcia. And for the PES, again, Secretary General Achim Post. The floor is yours. So, uh, Za and Giacomo were very generous to me. They told me, make it in one minute the last four years. So I would say that's not a problem. You have seen nearly everything. So number one, PS, we all together made a strong, wonderful and successful campaign with our strong common candidate, Franz Timmermans. <laughs> and Franz, didn't make it like a locomotive. He made it like a high-speed train. So we followed this example. After the election, we formed in the institutions a good team in the commission, in the SND group, and in the PS. And our new leader told us, we did it together, and we will do it together. And therefore, Irache, I want to tell everybody here, I can praise you. We are honored working together with you and your whole team and the whole member of parliament and our SND group. Thanks for that. Yeah. And last sentence, because a minute is gone then. We should continue like in the last years. We should improve, and we should do it like our friends in Sweden and Magdalena Andersson, having 30% in an election campaign. Thanks for that, and thank you for everything. Compañeras. Colleagues. Amigas y amigos. Friends. Qué placer poder estar hoy. What a pleasure to be here in Berlin today and how wonderful it is to finally be able to meet again after these very difficult years. The situation today is complicated, we know that, but we should celebrate the fact that the socialist, the European Socialist family has been able to meet again, and we're strong and we're brave. Strong with our parties, with our representatives, with our activists, and with our leaders, and brave because since the last PES Congress, we have been giving a solution to the pandemic. We've been giving solutions and making sure that citizens are at the center of everything we do and not been giving power to banks, which is what happened many years ago. 
Este, este video, este video que acabamos de this video that you've just seen is just a summary of the incredible work that's been done by our party, uh, by our group in the European Parliament over the past years. And since the last European elections, all of this is what our group has done in coordination with the PES, with Ahim, with our commissioners, with the high representative, and with our prime ministers and presidents. Friends, today in Berlin, we are meeting again as a political family, and we are proud and um, we are, uh, hold the leadership. Why are we proud? Well, because we are defending the ecological transition without leaving anyone behind, because we're defending democracy and equality and feminism. And yes, leaders, why? Because we are transforming our Europe into a more fair place in the streets, in our parliaments, in our governments, as Olaf Scholz and the SPD is doing in Germany. Colleagues, we are the strength that works for a fairer and more democratic Europe. We are the force that closes the door to the extreme right in governments and not like others, not like others are doing today. No, we're not having Melones, Bolsonaro's, Pascales, Trump, Putin, none of those are welcome. Compañeras, compañeras y compañeros. Colleagues. Ante el post -fascismo. When we're facing post-fascism, we want social democracy, a strong and uh, clear social democracy. Dear, dear colleagues, we must to be proud of what our 145 members of the European Parliament from 26 member states have achieved so far. Together with our political family, our key partners and with the civil society. These last three years felt like 10. The pandemic, Brexit, war in Ukraine, social and economic crisis, and we have done our best. Believe me, it is an honor to be chairing this group that works so hard to deliver. A group a group that uh, has been driving force of a recent historic decisions of the EU, a group that has shown that economic recovery is not austerity, a group that has strengthened the EU social pillar and that has brought in European minimum salaries, a group that has built a green transition with a red heart, a group that has proved that there is no democracy without rule of law. A group, a group managed to push von der Leyen for a directive to tackle violence against women because there is no Europe if women are killed for being women. Comrades, comrades, we have achieved a lot, of course. Together, we have shown that it is both necessary and possible to reshape our union. We are unstoppable, but there is still a lot to do. Facing Putin's war and its consequences, a fair legislation to deliver the Green Deal, a more social and more transparent Europe. And you know what? We will do it. We will. Dear friends. Dear friends, we are and we continue being the political family of those who have problems to pay their food and their electricity bills. We are the political family of those who have worked in hospital during the pandemic, of those young people who deserve a greener and better future, of women who cannot wait any longer for the real equality with men. Yes, we are the political family that will continue working for a bright European future. And
as the sun says, it is always darkest before the dawn. And now our political family will continue fighting to bring hope to all citizens. We are the proud socialist democratic family and we will, we, we will win the next European elections. Let's bring a better future. Europe, Europe, Europe is watching us, dear friends. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you, Irace. Thank you, Akim. And now it's a moment that we've been uh, long waiting for. It is a personal pleasure to introduce the leader of the SPD, Lars Klimbeil, to take the floor, make his speech, and uh, show leadership from the side of the SPD, who, as we said, carries an important responsibility for all of us in Europe and in our family. Lars. Dear Sergei, dear Stefan, dear comrades, dear friends, I'm delighted to welcome you at this year's PS Congress here in Berlin. I'm very proud as leader of the Social Democratic Party in Germany to welcome you all here in Berlin. I'm happy to have you here. It's a great picture to see all of you, so welcome here to Berlin. And first of all, let me thank Sergei for the great work and the leadership he provided to our political family. Dear Sergei, thanks a lot for your political work. <laughs> Comrades, our continent is under attack. Our values are under attack. Vladimir Putin thought that he could divide us. He thought that he could divide Europe, but he was mistaken. He made us stronger. He brought us closer together. We stand here united against Putin's war, and we stand united in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. And I will, I will switch to Germany in a few seconds, but let me say this. As we face multiple crises, the sight of comrades from more than 50 countries at this Congress fills me with hope. It shows how strong our political family is. It shows our ambition to fight for a more just, peaceful, and free future. Dear comrades, our attitude is very clear. The European social democracy stands for a Europe that stands together, that works together with courage for Europe. And I tell you, as a family of parties, we can look confidently at what we are facing now with view of the European elections in uh, 2024. We, it is clear that we want to be the strongest faction in the European Parliament. We want to win the European elections. Das ist, das ist this is our aspiration, that is my aspiration as the General Secretary of the Social Democratic Party of Germany, and I say with proud as the uh, um, chair of the oldest Social Democratic Party in Europe. We want power, we want to win, but not for its own sake. It is our ambition to provide security to the citizens, especially, dear colleagues, in times of change. We want to take responsibility in order to make sure that there will be peace and prosperity in our continent in future as well. And social democracy is the protective power for the citizens of Europe. Wir können stolz I can tell you, we can look back proudly on what we have achieved for Europe in the past years. It was European Social Democrats EU dafür who made sure with Next Generation EU that the reconstruction after the pandemic by climate protection, digitization is um, successful and will be achieved, and it was Social Democrats who, with the financing of um, 
work furloughs for companies made sure that people didn't lose their jobs. And Social Democrats and ahead of them, Franz Timmermans, who showed the way with the Green Deal to make sure that Europe will be the first climate neutral continent on the world. We are an example. At the same time, we are creating jobs and innovation all over Europe. And yes, as Social Democrats, we are the ones who made sure during the current crisis that we intervene in the energy markets, that the windfall profits of energy companies are skimmed off in order to reduce the energy prices to make sure that they remain affordable for the citizens and the companies in Europe. This wouldn't have existed without the Social Democrats, and we can be proud of this, comrades. But I'll also tell you that we're not resting on our laurels. There are massive changes going on at the moment, and we need an even stronger European Union, a European Union that is marked by social democratic thoughts. We are for a strong policy of innovation, for strong companies, for strong trade unions, for economic um, progress, for climate um, protection. And these things are not competing with each other. They complement each other. And this way of thinking, that sets us apart from the thinking of other political parties here economic strength, social uh, justice, and climate change. Seeing all of these together, that is the future of Europe, and we want to lead the European continent into this future. Europe has to think geopolitically again and act that way too. We are convinced of it. I am proud that we, as a family of parties, fight decidedly for the expansion of uh, the Euro European Union. We want the accession of the Balkan states. Let me make that very clear. And it was clear, that it was important that Europe was unanimously in favor to give the Mold to give the Republic of Moldova and Ukraine the um, candidate status and prospectively also to Georgia. Europe needs to be able to expand able to act and to decide. But that only works with reform on the inside. We finally need majority decisions in foreign policy. That's long overdue. But let me tell you, this European momentum that exists at the moment, let's use this in order to bring it about. We also have to invest in our joint security. The accession of Finland and Sweden to NATO is right. We have to expand the cooperation in the security policy, and I say this as a German social democrat on this stage with a hint of self-criticism. Um, the security of our Middle and Eastern European um, partners is our security as well. A strong and joined and united Europe is the best answer to a world in change. A strong and solidary Europe is the best answer to uh, Vladimir Putin. It is good for social cohesion and the prosperity of citizens in Europe. And I tell you, everything that I have uh, said now has been consensus for a long time in Europe, even with the conservatives. But what I have to experience these days in Europe is uh, worrying. The post-fascists who are setting about ruling the country in Italy and in Sweden as well. And if I look at what the European People's Party says with Manfred Weber at its helm, he uh, is interfering in election proceedings uh, favoring the right populists. We need to have a strong position against right-wing populism, and the conservatives don't have that anymore. Dear colleagues, dear comrades, the Conservatives cannot be silent um, in the face of right-wing extremism or even help them along. But we as Social Democrats, we are the bulwark against the extreme right in Europe, dear comrades, and that is one of the most important conflicts that we have on this continent at the moment. We will lead it and we will win it, I tell you this, colleagues and comrades. Dear comrades, dear friends, look around, citizens from more than 50 countries across Europe, 
in one room. And this is what we could achieve if we work together across borders peacefully for a society of respect, for the well-being of our citizens, for peace, freedom, and social justice in Europe. And this spirit is what dictators such as Vladimir Putin fear, what he fights. But I tell you, he will not succeed. Europe will prevail. Ukraine will prevail. Our freedom and democracy will prevail. This is what social democrats all over Europe stand for. This is what we fight for. United, we stand with courage for Europe. Thank you. Have a good Congress. Welcome to Berlin. Thank you, Lars Klingbeil. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you very much. So, congrats. Um, friends, now we move to uh, a different section of today's program. We have brought together, as we've seen today, a wonderful group of leaders and special persons in our family to speak about the most important challenges for Europe. And now we will start our first panel with the title, Our Europe Next to Its Citizens. And for this panel, I would like to welcome uh, on the stage the European Commissioner, Elisa Ferreira the president of the PES group in the Committee of the Regions, Vasco Cordeiro, the PFDA leader, Atje Kauken, the leader of the SDP, Croatia, Peja Gerbin, the leader of the Irish Labour Party, Ivana Bacic, and last but not least, the moderator of this panel, which is the deputy mayor of Budapest, Kata Tuto. And George. It is an honor to uh, serve as a moderator for the first panel of the Congress. My name is Kota Tutu. I'm deputy mayor of Budapest, one of the last reserves of democracy in Hungary. Thank you. Our, your support is more important than ever being under siege all the time. I'm also here representing the Committee of the Regions and of course MSP, my, uh, my home party. This panel is important, all panels are important, but uh, these times we live in with this constant crisis management of post-pandemic, ongoing war in Ukraine, climate crisis, energy crisis, rising cost of living, it was never more important that we not just be close to our citizens, but we feel our citizens. Now more than ever, the European Union must respond to the concern of its uh, people and act in united and a strong way. As progressives, it is our duty to lead Europe through a change to ensure that the EU always stands by them. This is why we are happy to have such important political figures with us to discuss these issues today. And we will have a quite quick rounds. Short question, short answers. Uh, my first question will go to Commissioner for Cohesion and Reforms, Elisa Ferreira, about cohesion policy in two minutes. So our, my question is, you have the glue in your hands. Uh, how can we better equip Europe's cities and regions in these hard times? Well, thank you for having a panel on this topic because cohesion policy is probably the instrument that is closer to our social democrat targets. If people are given different chances in life, if people don't accede to health, to education, 
to culture, to opportunities, then democracy is not a real thing. And cohesion policy is exactly the instrument that can give this leveling up of the regions and of the citizens that need an extra support to be able to have their fair share in democracy and in Europe. We think and we know that only united we can face the challenges that are menacing us. But a chain is as strong as its weakest link. Leaving people behind creates the weak links. It creates the fat belly where populism and where radicalism grows. So for all the reasons, it is absolutely essential that we use this one third of the European budget in the best possible way and this is the way to implement in practice our values as so social democrats. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'll turn to Atje Kuken. The Dutch government has recently adopted a plan by the PVDA and the Green Party for a price cap for energy prices for households. Please tell me a little bit about your plan. How will this protect your citizens? Good afternoon. Yes, we did. We proposed uh, a price cap for energy on gas, uh, electricity to make sure that the whole households weren't paying any more money than they did before the Ukraine uh, war or the, the war by, uh, created by Russia uh, was there. So it helps people with hundreds of euros uh, per month and it's uh, a budget for around more than 20 billion and we are in the opposition so I'm quite proud that we are reassuring people now that they can make the choice to shower, they can have heat in the winter time, and we urge this gov uh, to take measurements in our government for months, but they refused because they didn't see the depth of that crisis that was coming, but I'm very proud that we were able to do it, and we, we didn't only do it by ourselves, we did it with help with our European friends, our local uh, politicians, and working together and fighting together works and it helps, so very proud of that. You can be proud of that, thank you. Now I'll turn to my president of the Committee of the Regions, Vasco Cordeiro. As president of the Committee of the Regions, uh, what do you see priority now for this winter, for the upcoming months? Well, thank you, Kata, and uh, may I greet our, my fellow uh, panelists here and dear comrades. I think that what mayors and governors across Europe recognize as one of the main challenges they are facing this time is exactly to tackle the challenges that come from the economic consequences from the post-pandemic period, but also from war in Ukraine. And it all leads us to a situation where, for example, energy, the energy transition is one of the challenges, one of the priorities. Just let me tell you, the Committee of the Regions just presented this week a report on the state of regions and cities across Europe. It's based on a survey, more than 2,500 uh, respondents. And one of the main issues is exactly this one, the energy issue, the climate transition. So it's very, very important to recognize that this situation leads us to cohesion leads us to the need, well, leads us to have the courage to say that cohesion is the way forward and we need to defend and promote it. Thank you. <laughs> now I'll turn to Pedja Gruvin. Uh, in order to bring Europe closer to its citizens, it's important to build a bond of trust with transparent, trusted and democratic institutions. Um, we know that uh, SDP is working intensively in Croatia uh, in this sense. Can you explain a bit more about it? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, six and a half years ago when uh, the right took over in Croatia, one of the first targets were independent institutions and agencies. And the first one to be attacked was the agency that uh, regulates freedom of the media. We all know 
that for the right-wingers and the autocrats, uh, one of the biggest enemy are free and independent media. The protests were organized by one of, by one of the government parties. Uh, it was supported by part of the government, and they didn't react. As a matter of fact, they wanted to change the leader of that uh, agency, and we as uh, 25 members of the parliament have sent a letter to the Juncker's commission, to president of the commission, Juncker, and surprise, not only that they, they didn't react, but they didn't even respond. And how can we expect for people to have trust in the institution when 25 members of the parliament cannot get support from the European Commission and its president when such an open attack on independent institutions is happening? Now in Italy we have a speaker of the parliament who has uh, Mussolini's boost in his uh, living room. Now, more than ever, we need strong leadership in the European institution, especially in the Commission. And frankly, I'm not sure whether this president of the Commission is ready for that. And that is why, in one and a half year from now, we need to put all our efforts to get socialists at the place of the president of the Commission, because with this rise of the right, and knowing that they are going to attack institutions, from Italy to wherever possible, we will need a friend in Brussels ready to fight with them. Without that, independence of the institution and independence and freedom of all of us will be at stake. This is the mandate for the new president. Yes. Uh, and now I'll turn to Ivana. Fortunately, you know something about it as well. I Hungary. know deeply, yes. Uh, and I'll turn to Ivana Bacic. Uh, affordable housing, I read a lot from what's happening in Ireland uh, with the housing crisis. Uh, what can Labour Party do? Please tell us. Kata, thank you uh, for the question. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time at a PES Congress and I'm honoured to be here representing Labour. I'm only a new leader of the Irish Labour Party just for the last six months. And I'm here leading a delegation and we're here also with Claire Hanna MP from our sister party, the SDLP in Northern Ireland. With the dramatic developments, Cata, this afternoon in Britain, we're hopeful that another sister party, the British Labour Party, may soon be in government in a neighbouring island. Uh, on on the housing crisis, we have a chronic housing crisis in Ireland. We've had years of right-wing governments which have sought to rely on free market policies to deliver housing. And as a result, we have a whole generation of young people, my teenage daughters and their friends, who will never be able to aspire to a home of their own. So we in Labour, as an opposition party, have been pushing hard on social democratic policies for state-led investment in the building of public, social and affordable housing. And and we're also pushing for extended rights for renters, an eviction ban uh, for landlords this winter, and a three-year rent freeze. We want to see stronger protections for renters in law, and we want to learn from our social democratic and socialist colleagues and comrades across Europe as to what we can do to tackle and really address our housing crisis in Ireland. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll do a second round of questions, so I'll turn to Elisa Ferreira. Solidarity is a cornerstone of cohesion policy. It played, we always use cohesion, use cohesion funds to manage crisis. We've seen the, of its role in the COVID pandemic. We see it now with the war in Ukraine. In this respect, how will it continue to contribute to meeting future challenges and supporting the ecological and digital transition in the EU? Well, in fact, Cohesion policy is a long-term policy because for development, you need to have a long-term vision. But we don't want to foster any type of growth. So we really insist that it has to be cohesive, that it has to focus on the weakest parts of Europe and weakest situation of citizens, that it has to be green, that it has used the modernization, the novelty of the new technologies. And probably a cohesion policy is the biggest public investor in green technologies. In 21-27, we estimate that will be about 100 uh, billion euros invested in greening. This is our vision, and it has worked, because if you look at the growth 
that uh, uh, benefited the countries of the recent enlargements, you see that they had a GDP per capita of 55 percent, almost half. Now they are over 70 percent, 75 percent. So this was, this could not have been done without cohesion policy, without regional fund, cohesion fund, social fund. But having said this, it is true that when the pandemic struck, we had to create some sort of mechanism to, to, to be capable to answer in the emergency, and we did it. We did it also to support regions and citizens when the Ukrainians had to escape the war, and we did it again. And now we are just proposing also a support from cohesion policy to help uh, poor families or families in need small and medium companies exactly to be able to live with this incre incredible increase in the price of energy that is really killing the jobs, killing the capacity of enterprises and companies to hold on. This is what we are doing now with support of the European Parliament and with support of Member States and Committee of the Regions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We really try to keep our union together. I'll uh, turn to Vasco Cordeiro. Uh, local leaders, uh, we are in the front line of all the crises in the past two and a half years, from the COVID to the war, and now with the energy crisis. Uh, what needs to be done to counter-affect all these crises? Well, we must have a very strong commitment, but mainly a strong, strong and fertile achievements to tackle what people feel daily. And I think that's the main issue. The issue to give answers to what people are feeling in this current situation. Not only about the fears, not only about the needs, I mean, but mainly about the fears, the fears about what war will bring, the fear about what it will impact in their future or in their child's future. But I think once again, local and regional representatives are on the front line to give these answers. And I think it's necessary to stress the importance of the role that local and regional representatives do daily to address specific needs, specific issues. And this sometimes makes the difference between people believing in the usefulness of political action. Sometimes this makes the difference of people believing in institutions. And I think it's now it's more important than ever to stress this role of political representatives at uh, local and regional level. The ones that have the courage to take a step forward to serve their communities, and the ones in our case of socialists and democrats that have the courage to, in a daily basis, stress the importance of our principles and our values, have the courage to leave no one behind. Thank you very much. I'll turn to Fedya Scheng Schengen. We'll skip a little bit. Uh, Schengen is one of the most important achievements of the EU. I think we can agree on that. And Croatia has fulfilled all of the conditions to be part of the Schengen area. As uh, we await a final formal decision for Croatia, what should the EU institutions do to ensure that not only Croatia, but also Romania and Bulgaria become full members? What do you think? Yes, Croatia is one of those member states that are not part of the Schengen, not because they don't want to be part of the Schengen, but because uh, we are waiting and it takes ages to get in. Uh, we have fulfilled uh, the criteria that were set for us. Uh, we expect the vote in the parliament to happen in November and then uh, on the Council of Ministers in uh, December and hopefully at the beginning of the next year we are going to be part of the Schengen zone, which is uh, great for us because uh, it uh, allows not only for our citizens to travel more freely around Europe, but it will help our uh, economy. But we will, still have, we will still have two countries that will not be part of the Schengen. And I have to say that if the countries 
do not fulfill the criteria that were placed in front of them from Europe, from Europe's institutions. If they do not fulfill that, they cannot join Schengen. But if the joining of Schengen or any other part of the European integration is stopped by the blackmail from the other countries, that is wrong. And the message that we send, not only to those two countries, but also to the others who want to join the European Union, is simply wrong. Blackmail cannot be part of the policy of European countries, of European states, of us. Absolutely. Thank you. I'll turn to Ivana Bacic. Oh, with recent soaring inflation and rising energy prices, uh, European citizens are bearing the burden of rising living standards, particularly the most vulnerable citizens. We've been talking about this today a lot. Uh, what solution does the Irish Labour Party bring on the table? Well, it, this is a huge issue across Europe. All of us know this across all of our countries. Soaring inflation rates, rising cost of living and a real energy insecurity crisis exacerbated by Vladimir Putin's brutal war on Ukraine. So we know this and we know that there are some measures that can be taken at national level. We in Ireland have called on our government to address a serious problem where we are a high cost but low pay economy. We've called on the government to strengthen trade union rights to ensure that workers can collectively bargain for better pay because we know that workers in Ireland and across Europe need a pay rise to deal with rising cost of inflation but and that's a crucial campaign for us uh, and I know for many of our of our comrades here but we've also called for our government to introduce a windfall tax on the profits of energy companies. We've called on them to nationalise our own indigenous gas producing field, the Corrib gas field. And we've called for a price cap on energy costs, modelled on the price cap introduced by social democratic governments in Spain and in Portugal, because we know it can be done. We've also called on government to tackle the cost of living through introducing European social democratic measures, free, free GP care, free doctor's care for children and heavily subsidised publicly available childcare because we have still a very privatised childcare model in Ireland. But we're also conscious that many of the measures, Kata, that need to be introduced are best done at European level. And we model ourselves on measures in Europe. We've adopted the nine euro climate ticket as one of our policies, the policy that was so impressive in Germany as a climate measure, as well as a way of reducing uh, households' commuter, uh, commuting costs and transport costs. We learn from you in Europe. We, like, we want to ensure that we can learn from each other in adopting policies across Europe as social democrats and socialists. My own family, Katar, my father's family are from the Czech Republic and Croatia. So, uh, so we have a trans-European, uh, uh, we have a very trans-European vision in Ireland, We're very much proud Europeans, and we very much hope in 2024 we will deliver an MEP for the 27th member state, the only one that doesn't have a member, have an MEP currently. So we hope to do that from Ireland in 2024. Thank you very With much. With all of your help. Thank you. Uh, we got to the end of our round. I hope uh, Atya is well. Uh, I would like to first thank all the speakers. My, my duty is to wrap up. It's not easy to wrap up. So I, what I will do, I will call attention to a very important issue that's in with lining <coughs> cohesion policy and solidarity. So we've been talking about the energy crisis this winter that is coming. And what I see as a local leader, I see all across European cities that e the energy poverty, it's, we don't just talk about energy poverty of households, we talk about energy poverty of cities now. And a lot of cities are considering a lot of measures to mitigate it. And what they are considering, they're considering dimming and cutting street lights at the night. They are considering cutting <coughs> public transport. Cities are considering um, longer winter holidays for kindergartens and nurseries and schools. And what will this mean? This will mean that, yes, of course, everyone will have a bigger board burden on their shoulders, but who will have an even heavier one? It will be women carrying a heavier <coughs> burden this winter with the streetlights cut, closing women in their homes, women who will stay at home with children, again, like in the COVID, and who are the main users of public transport? It's women. We have to make sure that this winter 
it will be not only carried by women. It's our duty to do that. So thank you very much for the speakers. Uh, and we will move on. Thank to you the very next much. Panel. Thank, thank you. you for our first panelists of today. And then now uh, we go to our second panel with the title Our Europe Respect for the People. And I'm very honored to welcome on stage for this panel President of the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, Maria Joao Rodriguez. Yes, some of. And the Levitsa co leader, Robert Bidron. <laughs> PES Women President, Zita Kurmai. The National Secretary for Europe from PS France, Christophe Clergeau. <laughs> Esther Lynch, Deputy General Secretary of ETUC. <laughs> Welcome. And the moderator for this panel, my compatriots. Member of European Parliament, Agnes Jongerius. Agnes, the floor is yours. Thank you. But I think first a short movie. Isn't that the case? Thank you, uh, thank you for joining, thank you for the panel for being able to uh, come here and talk to us and please in the room uh, have mercy with me uh, because I think all of these people are interesting to listen to for at least half an hour and we only have half an hour uh, for the whole panel so I have to be short in my questions and I'm going to ask for short questions on a very important topic respect for the people. Um, I think it's clear that in this panel we want to address the social and the employment challenges we are facing at the moment. Uh, I also underline perhaps the victories we have already made, but as you know as politicians people are never going to vote for the victories you have done, but for the plans and the promises you make for the future. But we did some, we uh, reacted to COVID-19 first, we reacted to the war in the Ukraine, to the energy crisis, uh, and of course this all in the context of this present climate task uh, change uh, we have to challenge. So the challenges are huge. We have fought hard to bring proposals to the table and to make them a reality. We uh, pushed for the shore the short-term work uh, scheme, we pushed for the child guarantee, we pushed for the minimum wages, uh, for the Porto Social Summit, for the upcoming directive on platform work, so there is quite a lot being done, uh, and uh, uh, when I say being done, being done as a result of our collective action, this is never a task of someone specific but uh, because we pushed all for this uh, but there is more ahead of us uh, and uh, I have interesting uh, panelists looking forward to the proposals they bring to the table for the next 30 minutes uh, and I start uh, to my complete left hand side to uh, Christophe Glasio. Um coming from France um, I think the question, uh, which is quite logical, how can we ensure that the vulnerable will not suffer from the rise of the cost of living? Um, and can you perhaps elaborate a little bit on taxation of the super profits? Because there in France, you really take the lead in the debate. Christophe. Yes, thank you. We are in France fighting to recuperate the windfall profit, but we do not do that alone in our country, but it's now our common will, our common commitment, it's in the resolution we will adopt in a few hours. And why? Just because Europe is not facing only an energy crisis, but Europe is getting into a social crisis, a very strong and deep social crisis. And we need to finance a massive plan to support people 
and to support small enterprise. And we can't accept as socialist and social democrat that people have to choice between eating and eating when some firms make profits with no reason, with no creation of any kind of, of value. So yes, we want to recuperate the windfall profit, all the windfall profits, not question of 30% or 40%, 100%, all the windfall profit. And I will add, it's not only about energy firms. It's also, our friends from SED Group this morning said, it's also about banks, it's also about digital firms, it's also about maritime transport. Every firm who made win for profit in COVID crisis or this energy crisis must give it back to the society to finance support for the poorest. That is our common fight. Thank okay, you. thank you. And thank you also for taking the lead in this fight. Uh, and you see that when you start a debate, uh, you get followers when it's a good idea. Huh? Uh, uh, so thank you for that. Sita, uh, just being re-elected as the chair of the PES, uh, uh, Best Women, so congratulations for that. Um, uh, we have a fierce fighter for uh, true gender equality, uh, we know that. Um, what would be your main points uh, and calls to push for women's rights in Europe in the years ahead? Sita. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege to be here. And uh, I'm also happy that Philip Corder is here, that we started to work together to make Europe a gender sensitive Europe long, long uh, years ago. And I should also mention Paul Nuru Prasmussen, who has been doing a great partner in, in this fight. So shall I have a clap hands for these great guys as well? Of course, uh, I'm convinced that uh, PES has been the trailblazer for women's rights all across Europe, with ripple effect outside of it too. So now in these trying times, we cannot and will not stop. Nobody can stop me, as Antonio Guterres told Zita is the engine. I have to go with you alone because we can win the next European election if we are on the board, women and men, together. Of course, a long-standing call of PES Women has been to have a formal council configuration of EU gender equality ministers. This would signal that gender equality is a priority for the council and the increased cooperation in EU legislation is much needed. It would be one of the most effective way to achieve gender equality alongside tools that we have already in place, such as the EU gender equality strategy, for example. And that's thanks for PES, Helena Dali is the commissioner for gender equality and, and LGBTIQ rights. We made it thanks for the PES leadership and all the activists around Europe. Thank you, Sita. Thank you. Um, I announce Esther now as the deputy section, uh, but perhaps in a few weeks time, or shouldn't I talk about this yet? Okay. Uh, uh, Esther, as deputy section of the ETUC, um, since the beginning of the COVID crisis, you have been campaigning for wage increases in Europe. What does the minimum wage directive do for your movement? <laughs> Sorry. So I want to begin, Agnes, by thanking you uh, for your leadership and your courage uh, and working with the trade union movement to bring that minimum wage directive over the line. That minimum wage directive is going to put money into the pockets of the hardest working people in Europe. I've been a minimum wage worker. It was the toughest work I ever did. The hardest days work and you get the least amount of pay. And I think that directive, Agnes, is a legacy worth claiming. Uh, so um, the other important part of that directive, of course, is exactly as Ivana Bacic said, it's to make sure that workers can join a union without fear and bargain for their fair wage, because everybody knows the only way workers can get a fair wage is by collective bargaining. So thank you, thank Commissioner Smith, and thank everybody in the labor movement for working together to achieve that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and like I said, it has been a collective uh, effort, uh, of which I'm proud, I must say. 
Um, Maria, uh, people all across Europe are seeing their purchasing power decrease. Huh? With this high inflation rates, even if you have a good collective agreement, it's difficult to uh, keep up the space. And what do we think, what do you recommend we will do to reverse this trend? Uh, in fact, uh, we are in face of a great uh, danger of uh, inflation and something worse, which is deflation. Uh, and uh, the root cause of this starts with the aggression to Ukraine and then the blackmail on energy made by Russia. So energy is at the root of these uh, inflation uh, risks. And I believe that, first of all, we need to have a clear vision that the best way to ensure energy security and security as a whole for Europe is to go to green energy. If we are relying our societies and economies on green e energy, we also provide more security for everyone. Mm -hmm. This is on the long term. Mm -hmm. The problem is, how can we get there? Yeah. This is the problem of the transition. And how can we make sure that all citizens, they can come along? Look, I would be in favor of uh, targeting sub subsidies to the most vulnerable groups and to the most vulnerable SMEs because we can not have resources of everything. So we need to be selective uh, and we need really to subsidize those more in need. This is the first thing. Second, the implications for food prices uh, needs to also be under control in the food chain. Mm -hmm. And finally, the housing prices. And this has to do with the interest rates uh, decided by ECB. So we really need to put uh, the right pressure and in the end, the safety net will depend on the wages. Yeah. That's why collective bargaining and now the minimum wage are really a very important safety net. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this. Uh, and then the last speaker in the uh, panel in the first round, Robert. Uh, uh, he's, uh, by the way, my neighbor in the plenary of uh, uh, Strasbourg. I love Brussels. this neighborship. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a very nice neighbor, I must say. Um, uh, it's always the same group of people the, who are affected most by the crisis. It, uh, uh, no matter what kind of crisis, but it's always the same uh, group of people who suffer. Um, and I think the question is, how can we as progressive take the lead of protecting those people who are suffering most. Yeah, you're right, Agnes, and we all feel that the winter is coming, that uh, not only as a season of the year, but also uh, politically. And we as progressives, we need to deliver. It's our obligation. We need to have courage and strength and solidarity to deliver, because if we do not deliver, it's a fatal ground for all the populists, extreme right populists. And I come from Poland, and I can tell you a lot what happens when we, as progressives, as Democrats, do not deliver. 30% of the territory of my country is LGBT free zone. Poland has the most barbaric legislation con concerning termination of abortion. Just a few months ago, a 30 years old woman was one of the first victims of this barbaric legislation. This happens when winter comes to one of our member states. This happens when we are not in solidarity. And I tell you that coming from the country of solidarity, of this historic movement which have turned down this wall, not only the Berlin Wall, but this uh, iron curtain which we as social democrats, we should never build again. We are the best in building the bridges. So we should build the bridges. Okay, and this is you. the challenge for us. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, and I think we can do this. I think we can do this. We can build these bridges. but. Let's now go into the second round of questions, and I start again with Christoph. Um, you talked about uh, what you're doing in France, but 
how do you think uh, Europe's role in uh, employment and social policies could be? Um, how can we, from the European level, bring Europe closer to the workers? I will give just one example very concrete. And I have a question for you. Do we still want to be the Workers' Party? The Labour Party? Absolutely. If, I do. If yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have to fight about the work on the platforms. It's a very symbolic issue. And it's not only because I love Nicolas Schmitt and not Emmanuel Macron that I say that. If we want to defend workers, we, want to defend we have to defend the status. And it's impossible to go on with this kind of work on the platform with no right, with just paying for a tax, with no protection. Slavery is not uh, the idea for our century. So we have a good and excellent socialist commissioner who put on the table an excellent directive to give rights to uh, the workers on the platforms. And we have a president of France who is doing everything he can to block Absolutely. these directives. So we have to be mobilized to give, work, to give rights for these workers and to show to everybody in Europe we are the Workers' Party. Okay, and uh, everyone who's doubting about what the president of France is doing should read into the uh, Uber files uh, where it's very clear how much he was influenced by the lobber lobby of the uh, Uber platform. If you say that, it must be true. Okay, it's true, absolutely. I, I never lie, uh, or hardly ever. Uh, Sita, uh, uh, second question to you. Uh, can you perhaps dig a little bit deeper into the gender equality with a specific example? And then I'm thinking about the care strategy. It's employing many, many women uh, and the working conditions are not the best. What are your thoughts about that? First of all, let's talk about the pandemic, which has been affected uh, everyone, and especially those who have fewer resources. And of course, it is affected women and men uh, differently. Women made a lot of the frontline job during the pandemic as cleaner, nurses, teachers, cashiers, and so many. Let's clap hands for them because I believe this has been an invisible job and a very important job. But of course, uh, these jobs are still undervalued and underpaid. Although we all, uh, we all rely on, of course, that's why we have the equal pay day and the unequal pay day, uh, the 4th of December. I invite you all to be in the city hall of Belgium because it's the can't pass women is going to do a great activity. But of course, let's see what type of other activity women did. We took a lot more housework and informal care than men did. And many working women quite and lost their jobs and of course uh, switch to part-time, which means that they earn much less money. And of course this has clear consequences. Uh, telework can also be a trap for women uh, with uh, wireless uh, promises, more flexibility, unpaid work and exclusion can become even more invisible. Past women is keep pushing for this message through our campaigns and positions. We need to continue to promote a feminist economy which values care for what it is, the backbone of society. And we need to include women in decision making to make our voice heard. Too many of these women are not represented in the trade union's top position or political parties. And of course, they are not uh, on the most company or even hospital boards. So we need to promote their voices. We should be their voices, by the way. And uh, here we also, we also need to have a necessary conversation about the value of the work. I think it's absolutely crucial. Why should a woman who is lifting a baby earn less than someone who is lifting a brick stone? Okay, thank you. Uh, and it, equal pay is very central for our political family, for uh, also the trade union movement. So I'm now going through Esther again. Uh, uh, 
asking you the question um, about expectations of workers for the policies we are making and pushing. Um, what would be your idea of the main priorities at the moment? Perhaps the platform, perhaps the care sector, but perhaps you have other priorities, Esther? I think that is absolutely essential because in particular the iconic value of getting the directive to protect workers, respect for the worker, respect for the work that they do by recognizing that this is a worker and that this is work and that's critically important. The, the passport to nearly every single employment right is the fact that you're a worker and that you've an employer. Letting employers walk away from their responsibilities is a catastrophe. We also are very much welcoming the work of Helena Daly in bringing forward the equal pay for work of equal value because exactly as the feminist groups here are saying, it's uh, uh, an outrage that caring work, that cleaning work is called low skilled or no skilled? Who are you kidding? This is highly skilled work and needs to be recognized as that and properly paid as that. But we can't stop there. We've a lot more challenges. We need to make sure that there's uh, due diligence, that, that companies are held to account for what they do overseas, for, uh, to make sure that we have our place in the boardroom. I could go on a long, a long time, but just if my last 30 seconds, I can say, friends, we're going to be out on the streets in your town. We need you to join us because we're, we're campaigning for the uh, anti-crisis measures, we're campaigning for pay rises, and we're campaigning for a just society alongside with the other parts of the labor movement. So Agnes, looking forward to seeing you again and okay, everybody else on you. the street. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think this is indeed very necessary, not only to talk, but also show our face on the streets and uh, form this progressive movement with other uh, allies uh, in the field. Maria, uh, um, uh, perhaps um, you've been uh, uh, active at the European uh, level for quite a long time. Um, uh, and I, I just thought perhaps can you give some reflection on are we moving in the right direction or uh, should we say the previous commission did more than this commission? Inequality has uh, uh, risen up. How do you see, for the bigger scope, how do you see uh, um, what we can do uh, uh, compared to earlier uh, responses to the crisis? Look, um, if we go back to the period of the financial crisis, and everybody here we remember the, the big hit we, we could uh, really see uh, everywhere. I must say that we, as a political family, we could turn the tide. Uh, we could turn the tide by launching the European Social Pillar, which is setting fundamental social rights for all citizens, wherever they are, whatever the job they, 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 they have, and whatever the region they are in. And this was a major shift, and uh, it is uh, great now to have uh, our new president uh, uh, played an important uh, role in launching this pillar, but it was a full initiative of our family. And now uh, we turn this into an action plan and we combine this with more powerful financial tools. So we start seeing the difference during the COVID crisis, that's for sure, uh, exactly with the sure instruments and then with the next generation. And now I believe that we are under test for the new phase, because the new phase is also a um, period where the risk of a recession is there. And uh, we need really to cope with this risk with, again, stronger instruments, implementing the European Social Pillar, but also combining it with stronger European instruments, protecting citizens wherever they are. Okay. So this is my hope for the next period. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, and uh, indeed there is a, a line from the Gothenburg summit to the Porto summit to now pushing for the further implementation of the European Pillar of Social Rights. Um, um, Robert, to conclude. Someone has to conclude, sorry. Um, um, my main question...
question to you would be uh, once again, how can we prevent, how can we protect the most vulnerable group for paying the highest price? Um, well, there are many of paying higher price, and I'm very happy that the name of this panel is Respect for, uh, the, people. for the People. Because we have still so many people li living in terrible conditions. In Lithuania, almost 40% of people keep home inadequately warm. Where in Poland, two million people don't have access to the toilet. They don't have toilets. Uh, in many regions uh, of uh, our union, uh, the unemployment of young people is 50%. Just a few days ago, we heard about uh, uh, shots in front of the gay club. Two people were killed. Women in Poland, they're dying because of uh, this barbarian legislation. We, our obligation as progressives is to protect people is to remember that we do not protect people, when do we do not respect the rights. In 2022, right-wing populists come and take, they take the duty. They take the duty which has terrible consequences. And we said they see them in Hungary, in Poland, we will see them probably in, uh, in Italy. So it's our duty to remember that it's 2022 and women, for example, women, wherever they live, they should have equal rights. And it's a shame that we did not deliver this. This is still not the case, that women in Poland, they still go on on the streets. They fight for the rights in 2022 in European Union, in the heart of the Europe. And it's shameful that we still did not deliver that. It's our obligation, it's our duty to protect everyone. Okay, thank you for that. And um, I'm not going to try to wrap up all these good proposals, uh, but just end with this note. I think we have the good proposals on the table. We have the fighting spirit. Yes. Uh, um, uh, I think we have the fighting spirit. You have the clever ideas. But I think it's also clear that we should build coalitions. Yes. Uh, and uh, indeed, we should not only talk in this Brussels bubble, important, we have to win the fight for the platform directive in the Brussels Institute, but I think indeed uh, if women in Poland take the streets to fight for abortion rights, we should be there. If trade unionists are uh, going to take the streets uh, on the cost of living prices, we should be there. Uh, and I think uh, if we really want to fight extreme rights, we should claim our territory, be there with self-confidence, with the good plans we have, and with the allies we have as a family. So thank you for this. And thanks for the panel. Thanks for the panel. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you to all the panelists. Great job. Thank you, Mr. Pedro. <laughs> so, I think we have some important announcements to make now, but I don't see the leaders of the chairs of the Congress on stage. Well, now they are gaining their position, Alicia and Caroline, so that they will uh, let us know what is happening now. The votes are closed, dear comrades. I hope everybody has voted. Did every party go to the ballot boxes? Last opportunity, last chance to vote. Then now we formally declare the votes closed. <laughs> wow, well, so thank no you chairs for this announcement. <laughs> no complaints. And I know the room is waiting uh, for the result later. In a then we assume well, that everybody maybe is moving. we have to call the tellers. And we are happy about it. Are they already there, the tellers? Yes, they can come uh, in a minute when we actually have the final result. They're counting. Okay. Yes. It's you. Is it? <laughs> it's you. <laughs> it's me. You're cool. Well, um, we are in these very beautiful places. Berti Music Hall in this very beautiful city, Berlin. And we happen to have a very smart, intelligent, successful 
leader of this city. It is the mayor, Francisca Giffey. And we are now very happy to have her with us. Please come on the stage. You are very welcome. You are very welcome. Well, when facing challenges, cities, uh, citizens always turn first to their local representatives. And in cities, town, villages, socialists and social democrats are taking concrete steps uh, to respond to the crisis, implement the Green Deal, tackle social inequalities in Paris, in Rome, in London, and of course here in Berlin. We, this is just a few of the places where past mayors actually are leading the progressive way and making a difference. So you were elected first female mayor in last December. And since you have taken the job, you're making this city fairer, cleaner, and more sustainable. So we thank you for that. <laughs> but there are a lot of other challenges uh, we're facing, especially since uh, February. Uh, Berlin has seen hundreds of thousands of displayed people passing through, with tens of thousands choosing to settle here. How has the city risen to the challenge of helping those people? So first of all, I want to say to everyone who is taking part in that important conference, a very, very warm welcome to Berlin. We are very proud that all of you are here. So I know it is Friday, and I know the city is waiting for you, yeah? But um, of course, it's important to talk about the important things, and that's why I would like just uh, to answer your question as well. Yeah. So we have a huge amount of challenges. And of course, it is not easy, the pandemic, the Ukrainian, the war in Ukraine, and uh, also the energy crisis and everything. I, I, I'm sure you have talked about that a lot. We had in the last months a huge, huge development of refugees coming from Ukraine to Berlin. Berlin was the main arrival hub in Germany, and we have more than 330,000 people who have been arrived from February until now, and more than 100,000 people stayed here in the city. So we had, had to have um, 6,000 students in our schools from Ukraine additionally. That means when you see about one school is about 500 kids, so about 10 schools. Yeah. In, in, the, in the size. We made a huge arrival center for all the Ukrainians. We had in the first days 10,000 people per day arriving at the Berlin main station. So it was a huge challenge. And how did we make it? We made it by the help of a lot of people from civil society, from the public administration, from economy, who helped and who have showed solidarity, open arms, open hearts here in Berlin. And we made it that no, no not, not at all. One um, uh, sports hall has to, had to be used for, for the refugees. We, we made it in a different way. We had this arrival center and we managed to uh, give a accommodation and first help to more than 100,000 people who stayed here. And now a lot of them are working. Some of them are working in our schools. And we are proud that we have this made in the last in the Thank last you month. for this. You can see you can make a difference. Of course we can, and now we have to find this balance because our population is in worry about the following uh, months. We, we see that people suffer from the huge energy prices from, from all these things and we said, okay, we need a relief package here in Berlin additionally to the national help so that our population, our economy and all the enterprises will come in a good way yeah. through this uh, following months. We made a good restart after the pandemic. So in Berlin, we have in this year, we will have more than 26 million overnights. So you are also a part of that. <laughs> of Thank these. you for that. And um, I hope that we can make it. And, and uh, of course, it is um, a huge challenge also for democracy because we see when people are not um, not so um, yeah, when, when they are when they are afraid of what is going to come, 
that is, um, they are more open for sometimes extreme um, opinions and extreme views. And what our responsibility is to bring the people together and to say we give you the security, the stability, that we go together through this crisis. And that is the main task, I guess, uh, to today, that we have a serious confidence for the future and that we show that policy is making really pragmatic solutions to come over the following months. Thank you. I'm sure, we are sure you will make it. In, a couple of, in the last couple of weeks, uh, you have introduced a very popular measure, a 29 euros monthly subscription mm -hmm. in the field of uh, local transport. Um, it's a challenge mm -hmm. uh, for a big city like uh, Berlin to organize itself on that uh, specific sector. The question for us is how to reconcile the need for clean and efficient mobility with the need of social fairness for all your citizens so that nobody's left behind. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had in Germany a very interesting experiment in the in summer from June to August. We had the nine euro ticket. I, I don't know if you know about it, if you have heard about it. The nine euro ticket, three months all over Germany. And that was really... That was, that was made by the federal government and was, it was really a big success, especially in Berlin. In Berlin we had more than 7 million tickets sold. And we said, okay, when, it's, when it is going to finish, we have to do something which is continuing. And we fight it for a, a continuing ticket on the federal level. That it will be on the good path, so we will have such a federal uh, German-wide ticket from the next year. But we said in Berlin we want to do it earlier. And we started the, nine, the 29 euro ticket from October to December, and it works. So we have the target also for the long run that the mobility, the public transport, is not more than one euro per day for the Berliners. And all our kids in school, they drive already without any cost. So the kids in school, they don't pay anything for public transport. And we want to have it additionally for the adults, for all the other people, not more than one euro per day. And we see that we can make a difference for the mobility change, for the question of, um, of climate change, and also for the social question of participation. I'm really convinced in, if we invest in public transport, if we make it accessible, affordable, and comfortable, we, will, we can change our cities, we can change Europe, and we can really do something for social cohesion and also for the climate change management. Thank you so much. You are an example where social democracy matters locally. So thank you so much, Francesca Gefei. Yeah, thanks, and have a good time in Berlin. We will. Welcome We're, to all we of are. you. Then now we will go to our third and last panel of today uh, with another important topic, Europe and the world. Our respect, yes. our Europe, our respect in the world. I would like to welcome on stage the Prime Minister of Albania, Mr. Edi Rama, <laughs> the UK Labour Shadow Secretary of State for Women and Equalities, Annalise Dodds. The leader of Faroit, Conor Rousseau, our Congress Chair and President of the Young European Socialist, Alicia Holmes, Hi. Hi. and the moderator of this uh, very challenging panel is our friend, former MEP, MEP in uh, the Netherlands, Kati Piri. Your uh, Congress Chair. So, dear friends, is everyone still awake? Good. The party people are inside. So, thank you for joining us today at this very important occasion. And we invited you to share your views on some of the EU and global challenges that we are facing today. With one goal in mind working together to ensure a better life for our citizens in Europe 
and beyond. Russia's brutal attack on Ukraine has forced us to rethink how we approach issues of security, international cooperation, and communicating our policies to our voters. Welcome, Alicia. <laughs> As social democrats, we stand firmly behind Ukraine, and we have been at the forefront of advocating for a united response from the EU. And seven months into this war, it is time to take stock of the situation and assess how to best move forward. You have already heard in other panels, the far right is rising and accessing power in several countries, enabled by the conservatives. And our youngest generation are faced with unprecedented challenges and are struggling to recover. Cooperation with our allies has never been more crucial, and yet there is a risk that the unity we have seen in the last months may start deteriorating. So, panelists, I look forward to hearing your different perspectives on these issues, and let's start our first round of questions with Conor Rousseau, the leader of Vooruit. How important, Conor, do you think the focus on the welfare state in the EU is to keep its co cohesion and its position in the world? Thank you, Katia, and thank you all for having me here. Um, I think, as a social democrat, in Belgium we say socialist, um, that welfare state is everything. Welfare state is all. The roads we drive on with our cars, the education we have, it's all paid by the welfare state. But I think that some of the burdens are too hard to bear alone as a member state to provide a welfare state in our own country. And so we need more cooperation in Europe. It's not something new, I think every other speaker today said that. But we need more cooperation. We saw it at the COVID crisis, during the COVID crisis, the new pandemic. It was thanks to Europe, everyone here had a vaccine. It was thanks to Europe that it was more affordable. But it was also Europe who was too slow. And it was the member states, who are the member states, who did not really give a strong mandate to the European Commission so they could proceed faster. So more cooperation is needed on the cases of public health. But also more cooperation when, it's, when we're talking about foreign policy. In Ukraine, we should speak with one voice. And if, if, we're, looking, if we're taking a look at Africa, that China is buying whole Africa, they're buying everything, and we're still sleeping. And in 20 years, the new war won't be about gas prices, will be about zinc, cobalt. We're watching it, looking at it, but we're not doing anything against it. So more cooperation in foreign policy. But the most important thing I want to say to you today is more cooperation in Europe when we're talking about energy prices. Because I've heard a lot of people using the word solidarity today, but I'm not always seeing solidarity in Europe, even not between, thank you, <laughs> even not between member states, even not between social democrat parties. Because we need, and that's my message today to you all, we need a price cap on gas. We need, a pri and I, I, was, uh, I was aware there won't be a lot of applause in Germany for that, but I, we need a price cap on gas, a price cap to feed our kids. We need a price cap on gas to pay the rent. We need a price cap on gas to invest in education, to fight climate change. We need a price cap on gas to raise wages and pensions. Because every country in Europe, Kati, at this moment is spending billions of euros. Billions of euros to help people, to help them pay their bills, to help them through the winter. And still, a lot of working class people in Belgium, but I guess in, in all of the rest of Europe as well, still feel left behind. And when they feel left behind by social democrats, they will turn their back against us and look at the far right. And so a price cap on gas is something about solidarity. It's to help people and protect people. And that is what a European welfare state should do. 
it's not in one country, not only in one country help people, but in every European country help people against those uh, crazy energy prices. And so I hope that, uh, I'm aware <laughs> uh, it of won't time. change a lot, but I hope in time that all the countries and all people who dare to use the word solidarity here because that sounds good in a speech, they don't only use it for the good speech, but they show it in, uh, in policy. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. So then the question, of course, to the president also of the Young European Socialist, Alicia, as you know, it's her birthday tomorrow, is how, we will sing tomorrow, we will sing tomorrow, is how the progressive can then support, how can the solidarity be shown to the youngest generation? Thank you, Cathy, for, for the question, and it's a great pleasure to, to share this stage with, with you. Uh, I always try to repeat kind of the same message. Uh, we are the generation that has grown between crises. Uh, we had the financial crisis, uh, many other crises in between, COVID, now the war in Ukraine uh, that Putin started. Um, and it is difficult for our generation some, sometimes to, to trust in, in some projects. Um, this permanent state of, of crisis, I believe, that make it very difficult uh, for political parties and also institutions to get the trust of young people. But I also think that we, as a political family, are on the right side uh, for these young people. Uh, because we progressives uh, have delivered, uh, and we have a still to deliver for, for this generation. Uh, and I think that the European socialists have proposed very concrete policies uh, that will help uh, young Europeans, for sure, all the population, but for sure young Europeans. Uh, and some of them are already in place, but they need to be bold. What we cannot accept is that um, we have seen the, the change of paradigm in, the, in this crisis. Uh, it was a social democratic uh, response to the crisis. We'll let out the, the, the austerity that the right uh, parties put it into place during the financial crisis that was really hard for our generation. Um, but this, is, this cannot be the exception. The exceptional measures for exceptional times, okay, but this response has been for the people. And we have let it because uh, uh, in many countries, when we are leading uh, the, the governments, also at the European level with our proposals, because we don't have to forget that uh, Ursula von der Leyen is the president of the European Commission, because there was a deal, okay, but we put it our red lines there on the table as a, as a political family. So I think that um, these exceptional uh, measures uh, for these exceptional times are really well, uh, but uh, our progressive ideas that are there, because if we weren't there, the, the answer was not going to be the same. Uh, they, are, they, are not, they cannot be the exception. We need to keep pushing for this, and with this uh, attitude, I think that we will keep engaging young people, because we have many challenges uh, ahead, uh, and we need to solve them. Thank you very much, Alicia. And then, <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, it's a... It's also my honor to share this uh, stage with you, and I think honor for all of us. How do you, as Prime Minister also from Albania, think that what are the priorities in the years ahead for the European cooperation? Can you explain why is your honor? It's an honor because, uh, um, well, uh, this is a real politician, huh? Well. No. <laughs> it's an honor because uh, we have been sometimes in Zoom meetings, Ah. and actually discussing on the Western Balkans. I always find you an extremely interesting speaker, and this is not just to say it on the stage, uh, because you can be very provocative, which I like as a Dutch person who tends to be very direct. So it's an honor to finally meet you in person. Okay, let's say I am convinced now. Uh, um, no, I was thinking what would be um, valuable contribution to this uh, to this Congress uh, coming from uh, a country that is not in the EU but is still in the E Europe 
uh, and uh, being part of this uh, area in the middle of Europe, in the middle of the European Union, but out of the European Union, the Western Balkans. And I thought that maybe it can be uh, not a bad idea to, to try and uh, convey here the, the message that what started some days ago or a few weeks ago in Prague with this attempt to uh, unite Europe beyond the borders of the European Union and to include countries that in one way or the other are connected uh, to not simply the fate of Europe but also to how the European Union uh, moves uh, forward. Uh, it's still a big question. Yes, this community is needed. We have seen it, especially in times that are uh, becoming more and more common times and uh, bringing more and more common challenges. But how this community will be functioning in a way that at the end everyone can see results. How this community can be functioning in a way that when it comes to the huge common challenges, no one is left behind and no one's contribution to the European uh, common position is not taken for granted. We have had a, a horrible experience with the European Union when uh, the pandemic started and when the European Union uh, gathered in uh, rush and uh, uh, pressure under big anxiety to start vaccination. And uh, in the first row of uh, vaccination, we were completely forgotten. So we had, to, we had to watch how others around us could start vaccinate their elderly, their nurses, their doctors, while we, the Western Balkan people, although being so faithful and so, and so loyal to, to Europe, were like fishes out of water. And what we could do? We had to run to find vaccines exactly where the narrative of the European Union says comes the danger. China, Russia, and Turkey. And if, for example, in the case of Albania, was not for Turkey uh, and for President Erdogan, we would not have been able to vaccinate anyone for quite a long time. Uh, same goes for Serbia and China. And uh, somehow also Russia. So this was a big, big, uh, uh, frightening moment uh, to, so because we could see in a very hard situation that the European Union was not there, was not there for us, was not there for our people, was not there in a matter of life and death. Now, here we are. The energy crisis is not the pandemic, but it's similar when it comes to the power to hit and to, to disrupt the whole uh, community of, uh, of Europeans, let's say. And I hope that will not be the case again, that uh, whatever solutions might be found within the European Union and however the European Union might decide to support uh, member states to uh, somehow stand the the, the big, big, big uh, punch, we will not be again left out of it. Uh, you know, we Albanians are, are uh, very loyal people. You know, we were the last to betray the Ottoman Empire, even when the Ottomans themselves decided to do something else. We were the last to betray the Soviet Empire, even when the whole Soviets decided that was not a good idea. 
will be the last to betray the European Empire, even if European Union will dissolve. But uh, we don't like to be taken for granted anyway. So I think that it's time to, to see uh, deeper in how this family, the Socialist and Democrat family, where, by the way, there is less solidarity in deeds compared to the EPP family, let's say it, because the EPP guys support each other blindly. Uh, we, we in this family need to first scrutinize each other to the point that uh, we make the solidarity even uh, senseless. So uh, I hope this will be somehow adjusted. But uh, uh, at the end, I would say that there are, there are things that are really horrible, you know. We are not rich countries. And on one hand, we are seeing our, our young youngsters and the best youngsters leaving because we don't have the same access to the European uh, high education system. So our universities cannot create the synergies and cannot create the common path with universities in the European Union. On the other hand, we see that even them who we pay from our taxpayers' money to make uh, to become doctors and nurses are swallowed by Germany like this in a second. So it doesn't seem really right and it doesn't seem really uh, European solidarity to see on one hand uh, your uh, universities and your youth left out of the system and so leaving the country because they want to be part of that system and rightly so and on the other hand to see uh, our qualified uh, workforce being swallowed by the richest countries. So, okay, it's the, it's the market, I understand it, but somehow this should be balanced and this should be uh, somehow, uh, you know, in a kind of uh, solidarity uh, in the sense that uh, our country, our countries should get something in return. So if uh, uh, there are no more young Germans that want to become nurses, we are happy to help. But we should be helped too. It's, it, 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 can't, it can't work, uh, it can't work in, in one way. And there are, there are several themes like that that need to be, to be addressed. And I hope this new European uh, political community is not the ultimate French delicious cheese uh, just to avoid the big meal, but it's a real meal, and uh, it's meal for everyone, not just for them with uh, EU, but also for them with just E. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and for those who are more interested in your specific ideas on that, I can recommend your opinion piece last week in Politico with uh, also the Dutch... Oh, no, this Chinese. was not all about what I want to say because it was a compromise between me and, me ah, and Mark Rutte. So it was, uh, okay. <laughs> was a Dutch-Albanian cooperation, yes. which was very fascinating, frankly, for me and for us because until a few years ago, Netherlands was the most tough and the most uh, unpenetrable force uh, preventing us to open the negotiations. But then they won elections and they were fine so they can see us <laughs> with another eye. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy for that. Then Annelise, Annelise Dodd, now also my former colleague from the European Parliament, but now also the chair of the UK Labour Party. And Annelise, we, of course, also in Britain, you see the cost, the social cost that are coming from, as a result of the war. And according to you, what are then the policies and how to communicate those policies to citizens that need to be done by Social Democrats, also by your party, by UK Labour? Well, thanks so much, Katy. It's such an important question. And can I just say, I'm so delighted we're having this discussion together with so many old friends of mine and new friends to obviously the UK has left the European Union, but we also have not left Europe. And it really is important to us to be here with all of you. I mean, on this question, Cathy, of course the national response will depend on 
national circumstances. It will depend on the energy mix, the fiscal room, the balance in every country between speed and targeting. But I think there are two things that always will set the Social Democratic response apart from that of other parties. First of all, we will always put working people first when we act. And absolutely, that's why we're Social Democrats. And that's what we've done as UK Labour. And I know the policy solutions we've put forward have been echoed and indeed in some cases foreshadowed by what many of you were calling for. We called for a windfall tax on the enormous profits of oil and gas companies to then get gas bills down and energy bills down. Well, not only did our Conservative government ignore that call, roll back on previous commitments to consider it, but they also slashed, at this time, slashed taxes for the best off people and for profitable companies. Well, of course, that's terrible for our public finances. It's been terrible for working people because the costs of mortgages have gone through the roof because of the market chaos caused by that ideological right-wing policy. So we will always take a different approach, putting people first, because that's what we do as social democrats. And secondly, of course, we're facing up to the other challenge now of energy security, important for all of us. And again here, we as social democrats will always put people first. In the UK, we've set out radical plans to ensure that our energy will be decarbonized by 2030 with a new public company, GB Energy, to deliver on that commitment, creating and supporting jobs up and down our country. But those jobs won't be the kind of jobs so often we've seen created in our country over the last 12 years of Conservative rule. They'll be decent jobs, well-paid jobs, unionized jobs, because that's what we deliver as social Democrats. And that is the difference with UK Labour and with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we all hope that elections in Britain will come very soon. <laughs> we come to the second round and I ask our panelists to be a little bit shorter in the second question, otherwise we will be running out of time. So, Connor, we spoke in different panels about the rise of extreme right, but now we also see them entering governments with the help of conservatives. How do you see this phenomena and, and what do you think should be our answer to that? Well, thank you for that question. You're asking the right person. In, uh, in Belgium, in Flanders, where I live, um, there's a, a long-running uh, far-right party who is now uh, on top of the polls. So the biggest party in Flanders is far-right. And, yeah, it frightens me too, but there's a, a big possibility that when there are elections in one and a half year, they will rise to government. So I'm afraid and I don't want my generation to wake up in a country where four right people are in government. But I think we found maybe a small bit of hope, a small solution to fight them. Because we're seeing in the polls that our strategy from Forat in, uh, in Belgium is pulling people away from far right and coming back to us, social democrats, and they're not they're uh, they're still the the biggest party, but not as big as they were two years ago. So, I think the most important thing for social democrats is not to stop when we're arguing why not to vote for the far right, and just saying, don't vote for them, they're racist. Point. That doesn't work anymore. We really need to fight them at our own social economic frame. What's really welcome is that, and you, you'll know it better than me, in the European Parliament, the far-right party from Belgium votes against working class people. They vote against fair taxes. Fair taxes for multinationals, so our own people in Belgium should pay less taxes. They vote against minimum wages. In Belgium, they voted against more spending for public health. And so we don't need to fight them on being racist or not, because that did not work. 
that did not went well, go well the last 20, 30 years. We're now attacking them on their, yeah, they're running for the few, not for the many. They're running for the elite. But those motherfuckers have a really, really Beep. easy job. They really have an easy job. <laughs> they're just against everything. They're against everything. And so another, another, and I'll, I'll, uh, Wrap it up. I'll wrap it up. There's just only one family who can stop them in Europe. There is only one. Not the conservatives. Not the Greens. Not the liberals. It's us. It's a social democratic, social democrats family in Europe. We can stop them. And if we're not going to cooperate more and better, we will lose. We will lose. As we're seeing now in Europe, I hope that we won't lose. And we're winning in Belgium, but we should win everywhere and attack them. Don't be afraid, attack them, but please work together and show to the working class people in Europe that we need a strong Europe and there will only be a strong Europe where there are strong social democrats. Thank you. Alicia, do you, do you think uh, the what, what Connor has been saying, is this also the way to convince the young people specifically to fight with us against the far right? Please say yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. Obviously. <laughs> uh, obviously, yes. Um, I think that we have seen during these last elections that conservatives, even liberals, uh, they don't care with who they are doing the pacts in the governments. Uh, they can go with the devil just to be in the government. And I think that we need to say it loud. And we as a young generation, and I see here also uh, friends for our, our, the, the, the youth branches of our parties, uh, we need to do a lot of work because in the end, uh, we need to explain people who is going to defend the public education? Who is going to defend the, the uh, universal uh, healthcare systems? Who is going to defend uh, to put a, a cap on housing prices? Uh, who is going to defend the, uh, our emancipation in general uh, as a whole? Who is going to defend that rights? Who is going to defend uh, the law in the case that uh, women uh, are killed by men because they deny that women are killed by men. So who is going to do that? We are the only ones that can do that. We need to ask these questions to the people because uh, people will answer you. I mean, uh, they are against all these things. So I think we need to do a lot of pedagogy, but I insist we need to put our agenda on the table. We don't have to follow their agenda and answer to their things. We need to put our agenda on the table and explain what we are doing and what we can do for the youngest generations. Great. I see Connor and you fully agree and add, uh, add things to one another. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, also when you already raised some issues where you think Europe was not always delivering and where you think also the months ahead there should be more solidarity when it comes, for instance, on the energy issue with countries, candidate countries, like your country. There has also recently been cyber attacks against, uh, against Albania. What in the specific issue of security is where you see more European cooperation should be taking place? Yeah, thank you for, for the question. But first, let me express uh, my gratitude to Sergei who entered now the room. We don't have the new leader here, but the old one is still here. So, uh, Sergei, thank you very much for everything you have done. You have been an incredibly strong and uh, incredibly uh, uh, heartwarming point of reference in very bad times. And I hope this is not simply because you are Bulgarian social democrat, but I hope this is the spirit that will be also uh, transplanted to a Swedish social democrat and will have the same. Um, now, I have, to, I have just to, 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 to tell you in few words that uh, we, we were attacked uh, very, very heavily by uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran in an attempt to wipe out completely our data and to destroy 
completely our uh, system of uh, online services, which is a very developed one in, in Albania. And just yesterday in the new UN Digital Compass uh, development, uh, Albania ranked eighth in Europe, but in the whole Europe, not just mm -hmm. in our Europe without you, uh, and uh, 19th in the world, meaning we have a quite sophisticated uh, system of online services that is now part of the life of the citizens uh, with a lot of benefits in uh, eliminating uh, uh, time, eliminating uh, uh, queues, eliminating bribery. Uh, and they really hit it in a very strategic part of our daily, uh, daily functioning. The reason has to do with the fact that Albania has sheltered uh, several thousands uh, Iranian uh, opposition members because uh, we are a bit uh, a, a different place when it comes to solidarity with people that are in need. Uh, and it's uh, not by, by coincidence that Albania was the, the only country in the whole Europe to have more Jews after the Second World War than before, because the Jews in Albania were protected, and there is no record of a single Jew that was uh, delivered to the, to the Nazis. And then, uh, when uh, the crazy, the crazy uh, ethnic cleansing uh, machine of Slobodan Milosevic uh, started uh, its very dirty and bloody job in uh, Kosovo, there were nearly a million people that were displaced, and half of them, half a million, they were sheltered in Albania. Uh, and uh, lately, when uh, the the pullout from Afghanistan uh, was quite a messy uh, s story. We opened the doors to some thousands of Afghans that nobody wanted to take, although they were working for us. And it was a really embarrassing uh, situation to see uh, that NATO member states that used these people as uh, translators, drivers, uh, engineers, experts, and that pushed women to get out, speak, uh, stand in the line, uh, had this uh, terrible idea to not only leave, but live without them. So uh, we couldn't save all of them, but I'm very proud because we saved a lot of them. Uh, and it was quite a even more embarrassing to see uh, how much we were praised and how much uh, curious uh, journalists from all over Europe were to know why. Uh, what, what should have been the norm was an exception. And this was a uh, shame for, for the larger community. Uh, so we did with the Iranians. Nobody wanted to take them. They were being killed in a weekly basis in uh, Camp Liberty in Iraq. And so we decided to open the doors to them. And this came with a price, and the price was very, very uh, uh, scary. Although the, the attack did not succeed to do all the, all the wiping out, so we succeeded to, to get the systems back to work. But, you know, uh, we got some statements uh, of solidarity, which are very good. But uh, so far, we are not seeing more than that. Uh, and I don't want to make it a story of finance, but it's also about finance. Uh, we are, I believe, the only country in Europe that is 100% green when it comes to energy. Uh, but in the same time, we are based fully on hydro. So when God uh, does not cry enough, we have problems. And so we have to go to the import. And in this also, I see that uh, there is a problem because it's not enough to make statements and to applaud uh, countries or people for behaving in the right way, but it's also uh, needed to ask yourself how much. 
they are struggling to behave in the right way. Uh, to not let them then look elsewhere. And again, when it comes to cyber, this is just the beginning. I believe that uh, we'll be faced with more, not just Albania, but everyone. And I find completely surreal that Europe has not yet a common system of data and a common system of response when it comes to security. And to end, I, I uh, want to share here also this other side of the story, which has to do with uh, the people that seek uh, asylum, young people seeking asylum lately in, uh, in Britain. And British government telling us, you have to stop them. So how can be the, the, the job of the government of Albania to uh, put in order the channel there? I don't know. But uh, what I know is that if we don't succeed to go to the, to, the, to the source of the problems, and if we continue to speak about uh, the democratic Europe, the united line of uh, democracies against autocracies, and so on and so further, and then lack in action, when it comes to act together, not simply for solidarity, but also for common, for common goals and common sense, we are going to lose. And we are going to lose big time. Because there is one big, there is one big uh, disadvantage democracies have while fighting autocracies, and let alone while fighting a war. The threshold of pain of people that live under uh, dictatorships and under brutal regimes is much higher than the threshold of pain of people that live in democracy. Mr. Prime Minister, this is what I hate about moderating, getting two minutes per speaker. You should never ask limit of time if you, if you want to talk to Balkan men. I know, I have, never. I have to learn a lot from you. Never. I have to learn a lot from you. We Thank come from a tradition of a lot of talking. And it looks like Margaret Thatcher thought about us when she said, if you want to talk, find men. If you want to fix things, just do it with women. Well, we'll, fi we'll finalize this round with a woman. <laughs> Annelise, we, I think I can say on behalf of all of us that we all miss you. Miss the UK Labour Party inside the EU. But the final word is yours. What areas of co cooperation do you think are central to the relationship between the UK and the European Union? Well, first, we must, of course, work together on security. The kind of threats to our security now are those we could not have envisaged 10, certainly not 20 or 30 years ago. The kind of attacks on essential infrastructure, which does include digital infrastructure now, but of course also energy infrastructure too. And as we stand together on security, of course we must stand together against Putin's war against Ukraine. And I won't repeat what Lars said earlier. He put it far better than I could. But we all know that Putin's aggression against Ukraine doesn't just threaten Ukrainians, it threatens our values, our values of freedom, democracy, respect, the rule of law, it threatens all of us. So we must work together on security. And that includes also in Northern Ireland. My party, the UK Labour Party, has always sought to be an honest broker in Northern Ireland. And when in government, we worked indeed with many of you to create that Good Friday agreement with the parties, with the actors in Northern Ireland. Again, we did it based on our values. And we must again work together, the UK and the EU, to ensure we never go back to those terrible, terrible days. And the final reason why we want to continue to work together with you is because magic happens when we Social Democrats come together. And you know, Cathy, the last time that I was in Berlin, Boris Johnson, the then Conservative Prime Minister, resigned on the day that I was in Berlin. 
now I'm back. I'm back in Berlin with Genosse und Genossen, and our Chancellor has just resigned, the Conservative Chancellor, he's gone. <laughs> so what we need to make sure and ensure together is that when we meet again, maybe not at the next pens, maybe it'll take two, when we meet again, <laughs> stay here in Berlin, see what else will fall apart, but that when we meet together, we will have a UK Labour Party in power, delivering for working people with all of you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. No wrap up from my side, just a warm, warm, warm round of applause. I don't speak English anymore on a daily basis. Alicia Holmes, Conor Russo, Annelies Dwart and Eddie Rama. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. That was uh, intense, a bit long, but comprehensive. And it satisfied a lot of doubts and question marks that were animating our internal debate. Now is the time that everybody has been looking for, the debate on the Congress resolution. And it's a pleasure to invite on stage my comrade, friend, colleague, Yonek Poli. You don't need the mic. Oh, you do, yeah. Yes. Hello, comrades. Bonjour, camarades. Compañeros, compañeras, liebe Genossen and Genossinnen, I'm very glad to be with you today at this moment uh, of the day to discuss uh, about an important issue, which will be the adoption of our Congress resolution. It has been, uh, I would say, quite a, a challenge uh, with many, many meetings uh, to prepare that, about uh, six meetings with hundreds of, of amendments that have been presented. So I really would like to thank all of you, all the member parties, all the sister organization, the SND, the PS group in the Committee of the Region, YES, PS Women, ESO, and we can give you, all of you, a big applause for all the work that you have done to achieve the document that we will adopt in a few seconds. And it's an important document because that document will be the basis that we will use in the run-up to the next European election. You know, the next European election is not far from now. It's only in two years, and we have to be ready for that, to win and to be the biggest political family in the European Parliament. That's our task, and with that document, we will be ready to go for election with a strong manifesto. So now it's going to be a challenging moment because we have really lots of speakers and I'm very glad to invite them to come to the stage and to present their views on this resolution. But I would ask them to be very short because after this, we will go for the adoption of the resolution and then for the presentation of our candidate elect. So I would be pleased and please come closer to the stage first, Alicia Oms, the president of YES and member of the European Parliament. Alisa, the floor is yours. And then immediately after, Andrea Schieder, Mia Javornik, Matilda Erkkranz from Sweden, on the first part, the introduction of the manifesto. Alicia, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Jonek. Uh, I will be br really brief. I would like to thank uh, the PES for including all the uh, amendments that we as Young European Socialists have pre presented to this resolution. And I would like to uh, stop in a, a specific charter that I think is really important uh, for us, for YES. Um, it's a chapter of respect for people. Um, we really appreciate the very detailed ideas and proposals on youth policy. Uh, we feel our suggestions have been included. And the text it insists a lot on the quality education and decent job opportunities, including the, refer the reference to paid traineeships. 
uh, we hope that uh, sooner than later uh, this uh, way of working and not not non-pay work uh, will be banned uh, at European level and and that we could be could have good uh, um, good uh, quality opportunities also um, there, is, there are reference to, to housing. Uh, we would uh, have had maybe some more, but I think in general uh, the resolution is, is quite good and it, it takes into account uh, the youth, uh, and, uh, and we are really glad for that. So thank you, Jonek. Thank you very much, Alicia. And indeed, as it was said several times, youth is a priority. And now I turn to Andrea Sandy Schieder, member of the European Parliament and president of the Global Progressive Forum. Th th you. Thank you, Jan, again. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, dear comrades. Uh, try to be short, and I, as our Congress resolution is also very intensively working on the democracy. I think it is the moment to mention what happened, for example, in Sweden, that the moderates simply allowed that the Sweden Democrats, which anyway is a false name for this party, uh, that they will take their support. In this moment, the right wing took them over. And this is, I think, the same in Italy and the same we saw also in Austria, that the normal classical conservatives, which had been an ally to build up a democratic, better Europe, we cannot rely on them any longer because they are also going into bed with the extreme right more and more. And this is a big danger for European democracy. And on the other side also for us, European democracy is only a real one if it's a social democracy, if people are free from their everyday problems if they can rely on a social society. So therefore, I think we have very much to do, comrades. Thank you very much, Andreas. And I'm calling Mia Javornik, Vice President of SD Slovenia. Mia. Dear Jonek, thank you. Dear friends, dear comrades. With this resolution, I believe we are building a stronger Europe. We are building a Europe for the people because we, at Party of European Socialists, we have the answers. However, we need to seize the momentum. The winds of change have swept through political and economic uh, systems. Enlargement, uh, global financial crisis, COVID-19 pandemic, currently energy crisis and wars represent a critical junction in our recent history. And by and large, dear friends, we are at an infection point, sharing some of the mega trends with the world. Environmental stress, changing demography, accelerating technological change, increasing importance of information. We are saying that we are offering new ways of thinking. We need it to explore new and inno innovative ways of finding answers for the future. Simultaneously, structural cultural changes are unfolding, including new kids on the block and the widening generational and class divisions. Competences and skills for responsible and ethical data design, uh, digital design in smart cities 2.0, however, need to be required as well. This gives a Heckam curve a renewed meaning, or as our Zita Gourmet always says, those who don't fight don't count, and we fight, dear friends. Thank you, Mia. Yes, we fight. So our next speaker will be Matilda, Matilda Ernskans. Minister from Sweden, from the Social Democratic Party of Sweden. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, dear friends. Um, I will soon take on the task to lead the Social Democrats in the Committee on EU Affairs in the Swedish Parliament. Since you know we will have a change of power in Sweden, I'm now the Minister of International Development Cooperation, but on Tuesday I will take on the task to uh, uh, lead the Social Democrats in the Committee on EU Affairs in the Swedish Parliament. And I'm very happy on behalf of the Swedish delegation to say a few words. Uh, our general elections a month ago, the Swedish Social Democratic Party, we came out stronger after the, the elections than before. Over 30 <laughs> percent, yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, over 30 percent actually voted for the Social Democratic Party. But even so, there will be a shift of power in Sweden and we will have the most right-wing conservative government in Sweden that Sweden ever have had. And it is a pity and I'm very sad about that because I'm sorry to say this will certainly have a negative impact on Sweden's global voice. But today I'm proud to be here to address the Congress. Um, and uh, we want to say from the Swedish delegation that in the proposed re resolution, we really welcome the ambitious commitment on supporting 
Ukraine and the severe sanctions against Russia. We welcome our ambitious commitments to the green transition and we must keep on focusing on rule of law and the fundamental democratic principles. But the Swedish delegation, we also would like to point out that we are not in favor of the economic policies that would put future generations in debt. And we would like to remind that opening up the convention with the aim of changing the treaty at this point, when Europe is in war and we have a lot of crisis to handle, would risk jeopardizing our much needed unity and strength over institutional battles instead of really working on making a difference for our citizens. Because let's be honest, we have a lot to do. It's up to us to take on the task to bring back hope and trust for the social democratic movement as the answers to people's concern over increasing energy and food prices, growing economic injustice and fear of an over an uncertain world. Let me finish up by saying that I'm so happy uh, that uh, over the fact that the Congress later on this evening will elect a new president. And since I have and we've had in the Swedish delegation the opportunity to work very closely to Stefan Löfven, I want to let you in on a very well-known secret. He is an amazing leader and a person. So congrats to all of us. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Matilda. Thank you very much. And we are moving in uh, with the, the document, uh, the part on respect on the world. And it's my pleasure to call Luciano Vecchi from PD Italy. And then already after, Marine Elkers Eusen from the PVDA in Netherlands, Eduard Odinets from Estonia, Chi Ornwura from the Labour Party, and Jamila Madeira from PS Portugal. Luciano, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Yoneko, of course. Our party is strongly supporting the uh, uh, proposal of a resolution submitted to the Congress. And in particular, we consider that it's very important the part uh, concerning uh, the idea and the need of a, a rule-based multilateral system. Of course, we know that the international situation is changing dramatically. New threats, new problems are coming. Of course, we know uh, since the beginning of our history that the main challenges for the mankind can be dealt and solved only if there is a strong cooperation uh, or if there is a strong multilateral system based on the rule of law, based on common rules, based on a, a peaceful approach to the problems. Uh, we know that to avoid war and destructive conflicts, as we see now also in Europe, uh, is needed a strong multilateral system with binding uh, rules and with a, a good faith approach by all the uh, nations and powers. But we know now that uh, also the character of the international relations is strongly based also on the character of the internal uh, situation of the uh, national and regional societies. This is why, I mean, the fact that we stand for a stronger European commitment as a Euro European Union, as a, a global a, a real player, is something which is also concerning with the battle uh, between us and the right in order to have a real national, European and international democratic and just societies. This is why we strongly recommend to adopt the resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luciano, and my pleasure to call Marene from the PVDA Netherlands and then Edwards. From Estonia. Dear members of the presidency, dear fellow delegates, partijgenoten, from the start we have supported the Ukrainian people in their fight for freedom. But with the winter approaching, it is now that the perseverance to stand with Ukraine will be truly tested. And not only in terms of sanctions, humanitarian support or defense capabilities. The resolution also clearly calls upon the European Union to lead the way in supporting the country's economy and reconstruction. And with the US taking the lead so far, it is now up to the EU to close this gap and provide more financial support for Ukraine. It is clear that from the global consequences of this war, the climate change and democratic decline Today's world is marked by major challenges. Challenges that can only be addressed through multilateral cooperation. This is what we progressives have always believed in. 
And with the multilateral system under pressure, our political family has a special responsibility to do everything in our power to revive this system. Forming constructive and equal partnerships far beyond our borders and promoting standards that we believe in, respect for human rights, sustainable growth, and social rights. These are also the reasons why further on the mentioning of feminist foreign policy carries great weight for us. It aims, in the words of Ronja Kempin, to create sustainable peace in a world where no one is left behind, to seek new approaches, perspectives, and rebalance power dynamics where cooperation trumps domination over others. In this context, we consider a more integrated common security and defense policy a necessity and constructive part of transatlantic relations. And as progressives set out this path, they can count on the Partei for the Arbeit for support. Thank you. Thank you, Marijn. And I'm calling Edwards Odinets, which is the Secretary General of SD Estonia. Thank you, a member of parliament. Floor is yours. And then Chi Onwira from Labour Party UK. Dear comrades, dear friends, I'm privileged to be here in front of you with a supportive spirit uh, according our resolution. As a person with Ukrainian roots, as a person living a few kilometers from the Russian border, I would like to stress some points on Ukraine and on terroristic Russian aggression against that European country. I am embarrassed that we need to speak about the war on European soil in the 21st century. Unfortunately, we have repeatedly seen this type of aggression from the Russian side. Coming from a small country, like many of you comrades, we must ensure that international laws are respected. Otherwise, we will have no hope in this world. As a so socialist family, we must stick together more than ever to support Ukraine and help Ukrainians win the war. I will remind you that Ukraine is also fighting our war and the war of democracy, and Ukrainians dying instead of us, dear comrades. I urge all the leaders of the PS family to support Ukraine with weapons, supplies, and finances. In addition, we need to create a Marshall Plan for Ukraine. Our sisters and brothers there deserve that. Slava Ukraini. Thank you, Edwards. And I'm calling now Chi for zeros and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, we face many challenges. Putin, energy security, and the resulting cost of living crisis, which is threatening millions of families and businesses in each of our country. Crises of opportunity and inequality, the climate crisis. Solving these crises requires bold leadership, which will only come from the people in this room, the progressives in this room now, working together and learning together. Our solidarity is the only way to stand up to the autocrats, to lead the fight against tyranny and oppression. Now, despite what the conservative government, um, such as it is, um, thinks, the UK is part of Europe. Labour knows that. Thank you. European nations are and will continue to be amongst our closest allies. That's why we are proud of Britain's position as one of NATO's leading European countries, and why the next Labour government will prioritise working more closely with the EU on collective foreign security and defence policies to keep us safe, including a new UK-EU security pact. The principles are the same whether we are taking on Putin or the climate crisis. These fights are not easy, but through solidarity across our movement for all those facing oppression, we will overcome. 
So let us today send a message to all who seek to divide us by making clear our solidarity in our continued support for Ukraine. Slava Ukraini. Thank you very much, she and I'm now calling Jamila Madera, Member of Parliament in Portugal and International Secretary of Peace Portugal. Floor is yours, Jamila. Dear comrades, after two world wars, solidarity, peace, and the defense of humanism and democracy were the values that guided us and allowed us to live more than 50 years in peace in Europe. Defending EU's fundamental principles when facing hate speeches, aggression, and disinformation becomes incre increasingly urgent and imperative. As several crises in Europe show, the threat gets worse, finding uh, ground to instill fear, panic among the population. We thought, we all thought, we could never imagine that war would come again back to European soil, but it did. We had, since a long time, identified the need to reinvent global order. Now, with the challenge that this war represents, we have a choice. Either we go to the old days traditional aggression strategy with an endless escalation of force, or we use all our strength to push for a rebalance and multilateral world, ensuring that development, peace, security, and human rights are there for all. EU and the United Nations must work together. Today, Europe is strong. It's a true giant in financial, economic, climate change, and social model terms, but needs urgently to stand for its role as a political leader in a global multilateral approach. EU is the concrete example of how a progressive approach will lead us to a better world. Let's stand for what our founding founders claimed and let's build a new, fair, inclusive, and peaceful world where extremisms do not fit and cohesion and cooperation, cooperation can lead. We want a union that united, courageous, closer, and cooperative, and supportive to its citizens face the major difficulties of their lives. We want a Europe, so what the principal message is there, with courage for Europe, with courage, with Europe, with you, we will change the face of what we now call the fear that others try to impose us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamila. We continue now with a new section in the document, uh, change for the protection of people in need. We have several speakers. First will be Titi Tupurainen, Minister for European Affairs from Finland, Social Democratic Party of Finland, and also our chair of our GAC Ministerial Network, <laughs> very effective. Thank you, Yone. And then I'm calling also Nicolas Papazoglu from PASOK and Karolina Leonakovic from Croatia, please. Come to the floor. Dear comrades, when I look at you here in Berlin, I definitely see a movement for democracy, for human rights. That's us, that's social democrats, that's socialists. And now we are needed more than ever in the aftermath of Russian appalling, ruthless, illegal war in Ukraine. There are millions of displaced people from Ukraine in Europe and in the neighboring countries of Ukraine. Millions are fleeing the war, Russia's brutal, ruthless war. And we can be proud. We can be proud of our re reaction, how our people have received refugees from Ukraine, how committed we are to help people free from Ukraine. And let's be clear, who are the most vulnerable ones? They are people with disabilities. They are mostly women and children. They constitute the majority of people fleeing from Ukraine, women and children, and they, we must help. But we as Movement for Human Rights and Democracy, we must also be clear that we can make no difference to people's ethnic background or origin. Everybody who needs help deserves asylum. Right for asylum, it is a universal right. We cannot make any distinction between people 
from where they come from, what is their origin, what is their color, what is their religion, or any other consideration. Dear friends, now it's the time for a swift agreement of the Pact of Migration and Asylum, just as Ulva Johansen has proposed us. We need to fight against smugglers and traffickers through the anti-trafficking directive. We need to strengthen responsibilities, role and transparency of Frontex. And we need a coordinated and properly funded EU approach on search and rescue to save lives. And dear friends, if there's one race that we can all commit ourselves to, it is the human race. And this is the movement for people. This is the movement for the bet better of all people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Titi. Thank you. And I'm calling now Nicolas Papazoglu from PASOK. Come, please. And Carolina is next. Dear friend, as our minister said it just before, the war in Ukraine has not only economic and social consequences. Millions of people have, were forced to leave their homes seeking protection. This is not the first time we experienced this in Europe the last years. The memories from uh, 2015 are still with us. And as was mentioned before, this, is, this time we had some different reactions. Nevertheless, as socialists, we must make clear that we must not, that the right to protection and nationalism is universal irrespective of any consideration. We must protect those in need. And we have to make sure that those principles will be in manif our manifesto as it is in our resolution this time. We also need to emphasize on the need for a European asylum system, which is fit for purpose. We, don't, we, we must not repeat the same mistakes of the past. This is a time for, to cease the adoption of the Pact of Migration with a permanent mechanism of solidarity among all member states, so no one is left behind. To fight against smugglers and all those who use the human pain for the profit. And of course, we have to establish humanitarian legal corridors and ways of legal migration in our continent and in case cooperation with third countries, especially with our partners in Africa and Latin America. Finally, we must not forget the importance of comprehensive policies of inclusion and integration. Since we are there here, we have to integrate them in our societies. It's for our gain. We only have to gain if we do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicolas. And I'm calling Karolina Ljakovic, International Secretary the Social Democratic Party of Croatia. Thank you, Janek. Um, dear comrades, let me once again reiterate how important it is for our parties and for our movement uh, to continue fight for open and inclusive societies. With the war on our continent and with conflicts and, people in, and suffering of people all over the world, I think we must always insist on Europe being welcoming to all the people in need, seeking refuge and asylum. We should continue improving EU legislation on migration and asylum, so the legislation on the um, EU level. Uh, we have to continue building um, social Europe, making our societies more inclusive, equal in reality and diverse. We must never surrender to those that want to divide us, that want to tear the social fabric of our societies. It is our responsibility to bring socialist forces together, and we must work together with NGOs, with feminist NGOs, um, and with trade unions, so with grassroots organizations, um, to ensure nobody is left behind, especially uh, nobody that is vulner vulnerable, especially the most vulnerable, migrants, refugees, asylum seekers. So not a fortress Europa, but open and future-oriented Europe, welcoming and socialist, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. And now we move to the, the second chapter, which is respect from the planet. So change for sustainable societies, and I'm calling three speakers. Javi Lopez. Delara Burkhardt, and also Christophe Rouillon. So the first one is Javi Lopez, who is the chair of the Energy and Environment PS Network and also a member of the European Parliament from PSOE and PCC. Uh, Javi, the floor is yours. And I'm calling already Delara, MEP from SPD. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, to be here and address some 
uh, statements, words about the resolution and how important it's for this resolution and our political family respect the planet, that it's respect the humanity. We, in this resolution, we uh, have the work that we are doing now in the European institutions, our political family, leading the green agenda in the European Commission with Franz Timmermans, leading the green agenda in the European Parliament and also in the Council with our uh, governments. We, with the European Green Deal, we are creating the first roadmap for a decarbonized economy, changing buildings, energy, um, industry, and our mobility. Uh, and we, as a PES, as, as the PS, we have been working in the network of climate change, uh, energy, and environment, uh, this agenda with the civil society and with the trade unions and with all of our parties. And the message is clear, we need a just green transition with a strong social dimension because we have to deal with the cost of the transition, especially for workers, industry and consumers. And now addressing the energy crisis and the cost living uh, crisis. Finally, after a lot of discussions, what we are doing, a massive intervention of the market because markets are not enough to ensure uh, living conditions. What we are doing, control prices, cap of uh, uh, prices, tax, um, extra benef uh, benefits for some companies, and what we are discussing, also fiscal policy that they are an extra tool for crisis. Why? Because sometimes the debt of tomorrow could be the investments, the efficient investments of today. And these efficient investments of today are the prosperity of, for tomorrow and the guarantee of a common future. For this reason, we are leading Europe through a change that ensures that change is progressive with a green and social agenda that no leave uh, nobody behind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javi. And I'm calling Delara Burkhardt, MEP and delegate for SPD. And also, please, comrades, let's do a big warm of Applause for Sana Marin, the Prime Minister of Finland, that is with us. Welcome, Sana. Thank you for being with us. Bravo, Sana. Thank you. Thank you. Delara, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, dear colleagues. Let me start on a personal note. With PS, I not only share my values, but also my birthday on November 92. Um, so, <laughs> I can tell you when you turn 30, you get a lot of advice. You get advice to slow down, to settle down, to be more patient. And let me just say, let us not. Let us not slow down because we know that the climate crisis is too urgent to slow down. And we are the driving force behind the Green Deal. We are the driving force that protects the Green Deal from the attacks from the conservatives we are seeing right now. EPP is not shameful when they say they are doing it for the people. They are saying they want a moratorium on environmental policies for the people. If it's in reality that they do it for the profit of those who have made a business model out of the extraction of fossil fuels. And this we have to stop and we have to oppose your comrades. We are doing it not because we are against everything, but because we know Challenging the climate crisis needs transformation, and it needs transformation that has to be shaped by politicians. And this is what we are able to do, and this is what we want to do for the people, and let us continue with that. On a, on a last point I wanted to say, because I think it was really crucial what Eddie Rama was saying. Let us not make this European and European Green Deal an empty shell. Let us also be part of our partnership, especially with our friends in the Western Balkans, because we know that the true European Union is only complete with the Western Balkans, with Ukraine on our side, and let us them include them in this transition too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Delara. And now it's Christophe Rouillon from the Committee of the Region, the president of the group, PS Group in the Committee of the Region. Bienvenue, Christophe. Bonjour à tous, Gönnossen, Gönnossinen, de grandes villes socialistes, Berlin. Welcome, colleagues, and to this wonderful city, and well, I know everyone who's come from all over Europe. Et, uh, lutte contre la spe and uh, so we've been talking about uh, the fight against uh, property speculation that uh, devalues our values, and 
I can, as a mayor of a very small city in, uh, in uh, France, where we have 50% uh, uh, social housing, that we are working to ensure that we have a quality type of housing. Four, billion Euro uh, four million uh, Europeans are badly housed, and that's utterly unacceptable. Je salue l'excellente résolution. I very much welcome this excellent Congress resolution. And as the socialist group in the European Committee of the Regions, we've put down a uh, resolution that's been accepted. Thank you very much for that. It's an agenda for a social housing policy. The territorial cohesion policy and the re European Relance Plan needs to do more. It needs to do more to insulate uh, buildings and to allow to, for less CO2 production. It needs to do more to ensure that there's a protection of the uh, purchasing power because if the uh, if the uh, energy bill is lower, then there'll be a greater purchasing power, and we need to make sure that people can have uh, energy independence by consuming less fuel and less gas. Face, when faced with extreme left and right, we need less blah blah and more action, more results. Nous sommes la force du we are the force on the ground. Les villes, les régions. With our cities, with our regions, we are able to create a new Europe, a different Europe. And I think that at the next European elections, if we are able to propose a real program for social housing, then we'll be able to move Europe to the left. And social housing is a solution. Uh, housing is the key. Hello. We go Thank to you, Christophe. Our next chapter, respect for people, change towards societies of well-being. And I'm very glad to welcome Pedro Marques, Vice President of the SND Group, Portugal. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you. Thank you, Yannick. Friends, comrades, I want to talk about courage and hope. After the European election, we had already two traumatic moments that changed the life, the history of Europe. And by then, we were able, at the first time, to transmit courage and hope to the European citizens. Through the COVID crisis, Europe changed dramatically, but we were able to perform, to deliver with European response. We fought the virus together. We researched the vaccines, we bought the vaccines together, we delivered to the European citizens. And we also mutualized that, yes, for the first time, as this political family was calling for, for years and years, to pay for the recovery from that crisis. We delivered and we brought courage and we brought hope to the citizens to fight that crisis. And that meant also that this political family fared well in the elections, in Germany, in my country, in other countries, because those were the responses of our political family being implemented at European level. And now came the war in Ukraine. We didn't call for this war, but we managed to stay united in the response, in the support to the Ukrainians, and in the sanctions at the beginning. And also, we are still managing to do so. For instance, now, when we coordinated to create this that some liberals don't like to call it, but it, yes, this is a windfall profit tax that we'll have at the European level. And this was also something coming from the proposals of our political family. So what do I think we need to still give more courage and more hope to the Europeans now? It's also a European response to the social and economic consequences of this war here in Europe. We need that because we need to maintain the support of the Europeans to the response in Ukraine. And that means European response, not each country on their own. Because this war, this state of war economy is probably here to last. And then will come the recovery. And many countries, which means many citizens in Europe, will not be able to fare this situation on their own. So we need a European response. It has to be all Europeans and not some doing one thing, some doing the other. So many countries are able, it's not just Germany, let's not play the blame game, which is not fair. Many countries are being able to support their citizens, of Hello. course, through the crisis. But now, it has to be for now and for the next years, all together, a European response. So let's do it. We can do it. We know the ones that need it. Let's do it together. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. I'm calling immediately because we are running out of time. Thomas Petricek from CSSD, Czech Republic. And then after, Sally Deville, Apostolos Christophorides, and Emma Rafovic. Thank you, Yonek. Uh, friends, comrades, uh, 
Conservatives and uh, populists uh, uh, want us to believe that uh, they can make the world stay still, that they can prevent any change in the world we are living in. It is a lie, and we, Social Democrats, we are not lying as they are. The world is changing, and our mission is to make, uh, to turn the change into opportunities for all of us, all Europeans. We are a movement of aspiration, of progress. We are a movement that is fighting for life of our kids to be better than ours. And we are not giving you empty promises. The PES resolution has many specific, reasonable, realistic, but ambitious proposals and solutions. Starting from free and quality education for all, struggle for the best public services in the world, and economic vision, vision for strong economy and prosperous industry that will create the jobs for all Europeans. We are having solutions, not empty promises. And we will not let anyone walk alone. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I'm calling Sally Deville from Voreut, Belgium. Sally, the floor is yours. And then Apostolos, please. Dear delegates, dear friends, taking on multiple crises and protecting people requires a strong government and a strong welfare state. Taking on multiple crises and protecting people requires politicians who listen to the people and take care of the people. Taking on multiple crises and protecting people thus requires socialist action. The time has come once again to bring our citizens the message that in Europe we don't let each other down in a crisis like this. The time has come to tell a European story of solidarity. This is a story of us socialists. And despite all our difference, we're all in this together. The Corona crisis, the Ukraine crisis, and the energy crisis taught us once again, we all fall and rise as one. This is not only crucial for ensuring our socially protected societies, but also for the protection of the idea of the EU, where we help ourselves by helping others. Solidarity is the pillar of this resolution. The time has come to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. I'm calling now Apostolos Christophorides from EDEX Cyprus. Thank you. And then Emma from PS France. There are a lot of changes that need to be made uh, for the well-being of the EU citizens. For instance, the creation of jobs, uh, the creation of job opportunities, the implementation of a minimum wage, Cyprus is a recent example of implementing minimum wage uh, through an initiative taken by EDEC, the Socialist Party of Cyprus. Um, and we as socialists need to keep promoting on a multi-level approach all social income equality, gender equality, labor and market equality policies. We must fight about health. If there was, there was something that coronavirus has taught us, is that we cannot have any economy without healthy citizens. We must invest in healthcare and, made it, and make it acce accessible to everyone. Each and every person counts. The invasion of Ukraine has also affected the welfare of U European citizens. Any action undermining or threatening the territorial integrity, sovereignty, and independence of any state cannot be accept acceptable. Human rights is our priority, whereas Ukraine, just as Cyprus, experienced firsthand an invasion and still suffering the consequences. We would not, however, compromise with, with anything less than freedom of, of all people to enjoy what's rightfully theirs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm calling now Emma Rafovic, du Parti Socialiste en Français. Bienvenue, Emma. Welcome, Emma. Liebe Genossen, dear comrades, chers camarades, cette résolution va dans le bon sens. This resolution goes in the right direction. C'est un droit fondamental. 
access to work is a fundamental uh, uh, right. Unemployment is a machine that uh, damages the life of, uh, of people. In the in the uh, eurozone, there are six percent of people who are unemployed. They lose confidence in themselves. They are isolated. They're depressed. They commit suicide. You can't underestimate the suffrage, the, suf the suffering that uh, unemployment lives. And we are, um, are convinced of the dignity that work can give you. Work uh, transforms. It changes, and sometimes it makes you more in a more uh, precarious situation. And so. That's why we are fighting to ensure that the transformation of work is at the service of the human being. We're fighting to ensure that it's dignified, that it's well paid, and it's a guarantee for everybody. The PES and its member parties can count on the young European Socialist Group to fight to uh, ensure that we have a f future which is more solidarity and shows more solidarity and more uh, green jobs. Merci beaucoup, Emma. Emma is also the president uh, du Mouvement des Jeunes Socialistes. Bravo, Emma. So now we are moving to the, to the last chapter, change towards more democratic societies. I'm calling Kata Tuto here, vice, ma vice mayor of Budapest. Thank you, Kata. Thank Hi. You. Yes, democracy and citizens. Uh, I've already talked about today that cities, uh, local authorities are reserves of democracy and about our citizens. We always say that our local ambitions, our mayors are bridging gaps in our climate goals. But there is another gap we have to bridge. It's the gap between our European goals and the gap between our citizens. Because yes, we've met the most ambitious citizens in the conference on the future of Europe, but we local leaders, we know the silent majority. And we ask a lot from our citizens. It's not just a crisis, we put a lot of burden on their shoulders, but the, we ask a lot to change how they live, if they drive a car, to use a bicycle, to eat less, to change everything. If the local leaders are not strong, if they are not supported, if we don't have enough socialist progressive leaders, we'll be not able to bring our citizens with us. So please support local leaders, progressive leaders all around. Thank you. Thank you, Gata, and for sure we will do. Now, the next speaker is Katarzyna Kotula from Dovalevica, Poland, member of the parliament. Welcome, welcome, Katarzyna. And after will be Christy Morel. Dear Social Democrat brothers and sisters, I'm coming to you with the words of the Polish women and the message from the Polish women. The question of European democracy is a question of qualities of national democracies. And the problems and challenges of national democracies constitute the reason for a common European fight to pursue the change towards a more democratic society and strengthening of democracy. For that reason, standing here, I want to remind you about what happened in the heart of Europe, in the country, with the highest pro-European attitude, at the same time, an example of deepest, darkest problems when it comes to upholding the rule of law, and an example of deteriorating state of democracy under the rule of conservative peace and justice ruling party. While walking towards more democratic societies, we must be able to recognize all the red signs all the signals, all the mechanism of democracies rotting from within in some of our countries. One of those signs, an important sign, I believe, are women's rights, especially the right of access to abortion. The verdict of the illegitimate <laughs> constitutional tribunal forcing a nearly total abortion ban in Poland in 2020, which resulted in the death of more than five women, reminds us about the dependencies and relations between women's rights, the rule of law, and democracy. One does not exist without the other. Although they might not be visible at the first sight, we know that whenever women's rights are under attack, it is really democracy that is being under attack.
Please remember women's rights and access to abortion rights are the red flags, are an alarm on the state of democracy. Keep that in mind. I want to express the gratitude of all the Polish women. I want to thank you for your constant support in our struggle, in our fights. But I also want to ask you for the support for Nova Levica. Next year, at this time, we will be in the middle of the parliamentary campaign, and we hope to win these elections. We hope they will be free, open, transparent, free of any malicious interventions. Keep your fingers crossed, and the Polish sisters, thank you for all the support. Thank you very much, Katarzyna, and for sure we will be with you next year. And now I'm calling Christy Montréal. Avec plaisir, ministre de la région Wallonne du Parti Socialiste en Belgique. Prime Minister of the Wallowa region. Dear colleagues, uh, with the health crisis that we have all seen and the crisis that we are going through now with the energy due to Putin's invasion, we can see uh, to what extent uh, citizens have never before had uh, such uh, need for us. And one of our main values is legality, solidarity and social justice. We need these three things to be able to move forward as a true motor. And it's true that the future of our citizens will have to go through needing more social justice, but also more solidarity. We had enough vaccines in for COVID, and that was thanks to COVID. The fact that we could ensure that citizens of Europe don't die from cold or fall into precarity. Uh, to ensure that, we need to make sure that Europe takes its responsibilities and we need more Europe, particularly in the area of energy. That's solidarity. I'm here today to talk to you about these three cardinal values, uh, but of those three, I'd like to talk about uh, legality. In this convention, we have legality and it's at the center of this convention. It's the, the, the right, it's the equality and women in the left have are uh, not there just to be women that you can see. They're here to do something. In Belgium, we have our party and we have uh, equal levels of uh, risk, uh, um, uh, representation between men and women. Women and men have the exact same responsibilities. We have the same roles. And in uh, our region with uh, Elio and with the Socialist Party, I've been given a third of the responsibility of their government. That's the way the European Socialist Party becomes the number one party in uh, Europe. And dear com comrades, that is how we will win. And now I'm calling the two last speakers for this section. It's Victor Negrescu, member of the European Parliament for PCD Romania, and then Camila Garcias from Rainbow Rose, President. Dear colleagues, uh, dear friends, dear Yonek, it is an honor to be here in front of the Congress because I started as a PS activist and now I am here speaking about our common resolution. This document is really important for our political family and it shows us the fact that we are united around common values fighting for the people. And you see, dear Secretary General Akim Post, that our party is really organized because we speak actually about the resolution and we respect the assignment uh, for today. And this is why I want to underline three key points that are essential for our political family. One of those points is related to the common solution that we are providing for the people in front of the current crisis, the current energy crisis. We show that we have the solutions. We are showing once more that we identify a European approach when it comes to finding those solutions that can be implemented, and we are actually fighting for the people, for everyone, but also for those that need our help. Another key and essential point for us is that together, this political family is calling for the integration of Romania, Bulgaria, and Croatia in the Schengen area. And we are the only European political party doing so as clearly as we are doing it through our resolution. And I have to mention that our party leader, who's here, Marcel Ciolacu, decided to be part of the government coalition in Romania to offer our country this perspective that is essential for us and that this political part, family and party is supporting. We also thank our political group, the SND group, for uh, moving forward this important topic in the European Parliament and showing its great support. Last but not least, we are really happy to offer, through this resolution, again, our support and a clear European perspective for the countries in our region. 
for the Republic of Moldova, for Ukraine, for Georgia, and the Western Balkans. Dear friends, we are indeed fighting for the good. We fought for that under Sergei Stanisev's leadership. We will certainly do so with Stefan Löwen. We are the ones leading the battles with solutions, not the empty rhetoric of populist parties. No one is left behind in our resolution, and we will continue to be, based on our common values and those proposals mentioned in the resolution, the political force that will help develop a fair, strong, and social European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Victor. My pleasure now to call Camilla, the president of Rainbow Rose. Camilla. Imagine a world without voting rights. Imagine a world without human suff uh, women suffrage. Imagine a world without young voters. Without all of us, this would be the world we'd be living in. It has been our political family on the forefront of the fight for democratic participation always. And in the times that we're living in, crisis, technological changes, uncertainties, it has to be us all of us to once again step up, be on the forefront of the fight for more, democra more democracy, more democratic participation. We, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones that have to open up public spaces for citizenship to tell us and to intervene and to discuss so that our politics and policies get to the core of what they think of. But not to follow what they think, but to propose our solutions. On the basis of this resolution, I believe that we have a way and that we won't delay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla, for your powerful message. Now, we are getting close to the end of this session closed. So prepare already your voting cards because at one point we will have to vote on the resolution. But now I'm calling for the conclusion, uh, Elke Ferner, PS Women Vice President. Elke, the floor is yours. And then Maria Joao Rodriguez from the FEPS. And then Christian Petri, member of the Bundestag SPD. Dear comrades, till 2030, we need to achieve and we have to realize the Sustainable Development Goals. Goal five is full gender equality. It is very ambitious to close the gender, all gender gaps within only eight years, but it is possible. It is possible when we put gender equality on the top of our agenda in all political areas and in all political, on all political levels. During the pandemic, we have learned progresses in gender equality are not safe and we must defend them every single day. And we need to improve gender equality. No crisis is gender blind and therefore the responses to, uh, gender, to, um, to the crisis need a gender perspective. We need to implement a gender impact assessment to make sure that we improve gender equality with the measures we do. We spend so many million billion dollar uh, euros and you can make a lot uh, right, but you also can make a lot wrong if you do not spend it for the right things. We are the party family who fight for gender equality since we are founded. We stand for gender equality, which is a prerequisite for a sustainable uh, development and for a modern society. Equal share of opportunities, equal share of income, and equal share of power, also political power, is an advantage for the whole society and therefore we need to act now. We don't have a lack of knowledge, we have a, la a lack of action especially when the conservatives are in power and therefore dear comrades let's act now, let's build a gender equal Europe. Thank you very much Elke and now President of the FEPS, Maria Joao Rodriguez. The floor is yours, Maria. Dear friends, we are in uh, historical times. 
existential challenges confronting humankind and war back in our continent. We need to take care of all this with stronger European Union, but this can only succeed with stronger, progressive, social democratic leadership. We have historical tasks in our hands. We need to build up a much stronger shield to protect all those who fight for democracy, starting with Ukraine, the brave Ukraine, which needs to be supported until the end. We need to conduct an ambitious process to enlarge the European Union, starting with our friends in the Western Balkans. But we also need to build up a stronger shield, European shield, to protect our citizens for the upcoming crisis, making sure that they will deserve a real dignified life and making sure they will have the jobs of the future and they will move to a new green digital model with real social cohesion. These are historical tasks for us. And uh, look, we led the European project. We lost this leadership. We start regaining over the last years. This was our merit. And now we really need to lead and we need to win European elections. So this is a great resolution. We are fully equipped for this and let's work together. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you. And now I'm calling the last speaker, who's Christian Petri from the SPD, member of the Bundestag. And as he's arriving, I would like you please to have a, a big applause for Pamela Randy Wagner, the leader of the SPD Austria. Pamela is here, the next chancellor of Austria. So big applause for Pamela. Thank you for Pamela. Thank you. Thank you. Dear friends, um, I speak in my first former language, German. I come from the Southwest. <laughs> Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this Congress, Achim as General Secretary and his team. It makes you proud. It makes me proud to be here in this big family of social democracy here where we are talking about a resolution that will show the path into the future as well. So, Sergei, thank you very much for the long cooperation. We were together at the Ukrainian border. Um, it was a very moving experience. It was very nice. We're not losing you. You're still staying around. Thank you very much. We are creating a Europe of social justice. We are for good uh, wages. We are for parity. We are representing the working population and we are stopping the drift of uh, income and wealth. That is what social democracy stands for. That is our basic mandate. Strength in diversity, that is also something that's typical for us. All European countries are here, strength in diversity. But we have to be aware that in order to be able to come to resolutions, we also need a high level of agreement with all the differences that make us diverse and strong. And we are the bulwark against the right. Lars said it very clearly in his speech. We are the ones who stand up against the right, the political right in Europe, pushes back against this with good policy. We create a good European. Europe is more than the European Union. Those who want to join the European Union are invited, and we create the prerequisites to make sure that this is not an endless process, that this process can move faster. The countries are trying very hard. And as the spokesperson in the uh, German government, I know what I'm talking about. That is what social democracy stands for. And finally, we are the party of peace. We can be proud of this, dear comrades. In that sense, all the best and good luck. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Christian. And, and now I would like to thank all the speakers that, that took the floor uh, on the resolution showing the powerfulness of a movement, the richness of a movement. And I would like to ask you to take your voting cards to vote now on the resolution. Who is abstaining? No one.
Who is against? No. Who is in favor? Okay, thank you very much. Unanimous approval. I give now back the floor to Sarah and Giacomo, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Yonek. Wonderful job. Well done. Thank you all. Congratulations, Congress, for adopting this fantastic resolution. We know how much work it has been the past weeks. Uh, the past months. The past months. But we are proud of it, and we're going to battle for free, fair, sustainable Europe. We will. And we will under a new leadership. So the moment has come. I know that there is a bit of suspense. <laughs> and I believe that our Congress chair will uh, re reveal the result to all of us. Dear friends, dear uh, comrades, I'd like to thank everyone who casted his and her votes. 262 delegates voted. 255 voted in favor, seven abstentions, and no one was against. I hereby declare Mr. Stefan Leuven as president of the PS. Please, Stefan. This is the Let's PES relay button, and I deliver it to Stefan today with every um, very sincere wishes for every success, victory at the national level, also in the 2024 European elections to be the first party in Europe and lead Europe forward to a better future. First. Stefan, can we give you the floor? For Thank you so much. It's truly an honor. I thought I thought uh, he was going to hit me with this, but <laughs> you could also say that uh, this decision shows that this is a, a brave organization. Um, I can assure you I will do my utmost to live up to this trust. As I said earlier today, and we'll come back to that tomorrow, what we now have ahead of us is to make sure that the resolution, for example, that was recently discussed and, and uh, just adopted, we'll have to extract from that what we need to focus on, what we need to prioritize also in our common, common, uh, the coming, upcoming election, and that we work together, 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 as a team, to make sure that we do our very best to, to fulfill and make this resolution uh, a, a, a lively one that uh, exists and are present and is known uh, all over Europe. We know that we have the strength, we have the ideas, we have the visions, and we have the practical uh, experience. We have so many people. We have the diversity to show that we are now moving forward as a political force, as a political family, and we are determined to make sure that we are the biggest party group in the European Parliament 2024. Start now. Start now, friends, and prepare. Prepare for that. Make sure that we decide. Not perhaps, but we are going to start the process now to make sure that we are the biggest party. Thank you once again for this fantastic uh, trust. It's an honor. Uh, I feel very humble for this, but um, you can rely on me. I will be working very, very hard together with you. We do this together. Thank you.
so before you are leaving, comrades. First of all, congratulations, Stefan. It's a pleasure to start with this Congress, to start with good results. So we will continue like this. Thanks a lot. I have now to finish the first day of this European Congress with a very German request, <laughs> advice, order. Take it what you want. The Congress tomorrow will start at 10 o'clock in the morning. We have a lot of prime ministers. We have Zana, we have Magdalena. In next years, we have uh, Pamela. So, and we have Pedro and all the others, Olaf. So you have to be here 8.30, because it's a situation like at every airport. You know that from the airport. So tomorrow, we have that here too. 8.30 is wonderful. For all these, I would say, persons who think it's better to sleep a little bit more, 15 minutes more is fine, but not more. So thanks a lot. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. Okay. Yes. Una mattina mi sto svegliato Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao Una mattina mi sto svegliato E ho trovato l'invaso Oh partigiano, portami via Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao Partigiano, portami via Perché mi sento libore E se io muoio da partigiano Oh bella ciao, bella ciao E tu mi devi seppellire, seppellire la sim montagna. Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 seppellire la sim montagna e sotto l'ombra di un bel fiore. Thank you. 